panel. Honorable Mananiso. Okay, I just wanted to check if my video is uh, in order and as well, if you can hear my voice clearly. Yes, you can hear my voice. Okay, sure. Thanks. Okay, good morning, uh, members and guests. Um, I think without further ado, I think we, we are quorating, we, we are quorum, we are members. And the first order of business will be election of our chairperson. Um, you would know that we have been having an acting chairperson for the while. Um, so today we will um, elect the chairperson for the committee going forward. I think without without further ado, um, I would like to call for nomination. Recording in progress. If I raise of hand, there can be an indication of people to nominate a chair. Okay, ma'am Mananiso, your hand is up. You want to propose? Um... Yes, uh, thank you, Shanas. Uh, I want to nominate uh, Honorable Nompendulo Ulomkachwa as the chairperson of the committee. Thank you. Okay, there is a nomination for Ms. Mkachwa, the chairperson of the committee. Can I have a seconder for that nomination? By show of hand, please, and maybe. Mr. Litsie, I see your hand. Yes, um, Shanas, uh, good morning, honorable members. Good morning, everybody. I rise to second the nomination of honorable Kasha as uh, the chair. Thank you. There's been a second to the nomination. Can I have Ms. Mkachwa to indicate whether she accepts the nomination? Um, good morning, Shanaz, and good morning, honorable members. I, Nompendulo Tobile Mkatra, accept the nomination to chair the Portfolio Committee on Higher Education, Science, and Innovation. Thank you. Thank you. The nomination has been accepted. Can I get an indication if there's further um, um, nominations? Any hands? I don't see any further hands. So in the absence of there being any further nominations, I then declare Ms. Mkachwa, duly elected chairperson for the Committee of um, Higher Education Science and Technology. Um, congratulations. And with immediate effect, I hand over the chair to the um, new chairperson. Thank you very much, um, Shanaz, and thank you very much to Honorable Mananiso and Honorable Litsie. Um, it's uh, perhaps, I don't know, one perhaps to just take a moment to reflect um, before we go into um, matters of today that as a, as a, as a young black woman, um, it really is an honor for me to ascend into this critical role. Um, the organization that has deployed me to fulfill this mammoth task states that education remains an apex priority for our government's pro, of our government's pro poor policies and that it is a central pillar of our fight against the triple challenge of poverty, inequality and unemployment as outlined in the National Development Plan Vision 2030 and that failure to accelerate inclusive access to higher education and training directly threatens the achievement of this key objective. I think as, as a portfolio committee um, as we continue to do the work that we have been doing over the last uh, almost two years since 2019 in the sixth administration, um, under the leadership of Philim, uh, former chair Philim Apulane, we must recommit ourselves to access to higher education with the goal of achieving free higher education for the poor and the missing middle as well. Um, we must ensure that TVET and community college sectors adequately funded and respond to the country's skills needs and high levels of unemployment. 
This will include fostering partnerships with universities of technology and various industries for work experience for both lecturers and students. As a portfolio committee moving forward, we must ensure that there are special efforts by the private sector and other partners to work with the training authorities to develop the skills needed in the workplace. I think our president, Sir Ramaphosa, speaks a lot about the importance of social compacting, which would mean that it's very, very important for you know, um, private sector to come on board and assisting government in fulfilling its mandate. You know, we must target our skills development programs to the unemployed youth, low skilled people, and those in precarious forms of employment, including the South Skills and Education Training Authorities, see to ensure that they are aligned with national priorities and our industrial plan. Um, this should include a mass apprenticeship program that covers all sectors go back now work with learning and we must continue over continue foster relations between SRCs and management and institutions of higher learning. Um, least we forget as well um, uh, uh, members of 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 staff as well so labor uh, labor unions as well we must continue to foster those particular relations um particularly because um you know uh um we what we want is 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 to have conducive inclusive and safe spaces within institutions of a higher learning um so that you know we we have stability in ensuring that we don't have these continued forms of protest action that hinder um, the academic program of institutions. So we must have healthy and constant stakeholder engagement um, in order for us to have peace and stability within institutions of higher learning. Um, going back onto the matter of good governance and efficient management in institutions of higher learning, um, what, what, what has been critical in the work that we've been doing is that um, in relation to this is that people must know that if they do not have political, the political and social will to ensure that our institutions are conducive, inclusive and sp safe spaces for young people in this country to thrive within, then they must not be given the honor of governing and managing our institutions. Um, also, honorable members, um, you know, we've noted as a portfolio committee that students who are women and members of the LGBTQIA community do not feel safe in our institutions as gender-based violence and femicide continues to thrive. And as such, we must continue to play a close oversight role in ensuring representation within our institutions and creating a safe and intersectional space within our institutions. Um, in relation to infrastructure development and in infrastructure development programs in, in the sector, we must continue to play our, our, our robust oversight role with regards to that and ensure that government's plans to support institutions in, in strengthening their capacity with regards to infrastructure development projects, that government's plans to, to, to do that um do 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 come into existence and really assist us in in overcoming the challenges we've seen with regards to infrastructure development um and of course you know this also speaks to budgeting and so we must continue as a portfolio committee to advocate for increased budgets for the work of the departments um particularly on higher education but even moving into science and innovation um you know i think one of the the one the one of the things that have come to our attention is that there's so much great work that's being done within science and innovation but if there was an increased budget um, for this particular department then we would see more work being being done and we, we would be able to see a more intersectional um, uh, science and innovation sector within our country where we have more black women more young women um, within the space as well and that is something that's also very critical in the role that we play um, as honorable members, as the portfolio committee and ensuring transformation within science and innovation to do away with the idea that science and innovation is an elitist space that does not include the masses of our country and that does not meet the needs of, of the masses of our country. Um, so honorable members, I, I'm really honored to be given this task um, of, of leading um, uh, together with yourselves, this portfolio committee, and um, I look uh, forward to continue to learn a lot from every single one of you in the work that we do. Um, and I hope that we can, in, you know, have have robust discussions within our com committee. I think our portfolio committee has one of the greatest components of young people within Parliament in it, and we would love to see 
you know, um, um, that kind of participation across the various political parties continue to exist. Um, so we, we would like to hear the views of the Democratic Alliance, the IFP, the EFF, um, so that when we get to the House, you know, it's not like uh, we're having these conversations for the first time and whatever we present to the House can be a reflection of the views of this portfolio committee that exists within a democratic South Africa. So um, having said that, honorable members, again, it's just really an honor to be given this task and one really looks forward Forward to working with you going into the future. Um, so going into the briefing um, of this uh, of this morning, um, we will be receiving a briefing by the Department of Science and Innovation and the National Research um, Foundation on progress in the implementation of the new postgraduate funding model and transformation network. Um, sorry, transformation framework. Before we go into the um, business of the day. Can I just check from Shanaz if there are any apologies? I think I'm not the one of the of the minister. I don't know if there are any other apologies. I've not um, received any other apologies, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Um, is the deputy minister on the platform? I've not seen okay, him on the I don't platform. see. Okay, and DJ Mdracha? I also don't see him. Oh, DJ, yeah, yeah, I see you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll be receiving the presentation from the DSI and from the NRF with regards to um, the new postgraduate funding model and the transformation framework. Um, but we've also invited um, the South African Union of Students South to also make a presentation on this matter, considering the fact that I think over the last year or so, South has been very vocal on the increased demand for funding for postgraduate students. And I think this is a this demand is a reflection of good work um, or commendable work that's been done by our government in ensuring and increasing access to higher education. Um, perhaps also maybe a reflection on the progress we've done um, with regards to the, the, the outcomes of the basic education. So we have more young people who are being eligible to um, to enroll for, 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 for undergraduate studies and um, maybe because of the support that's being created through increased funding for, for students in, in your undergraduate studies through NASFAS and expanding that um, and ensuring that all young people who come from households with an income um, of 350,000 and below um, are, are, are eligible for NASFAS um, that does not get paid back, increasing that particular access in terms of funding and you know the ongoing sort of um, advocacy around ensuring that you have a, a, a holistically supportive um, um, financial aid scheme is maybe perhaps increasing the number of young people who can then uh, who are then eligible to 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 um, fulfill their um, their postgraduate studies, um, and so the demand for 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 postgraduate funding is increasing, and um, and as such, SARS has been very vocal with the need for us as government to respond to ensuring that um, young people who who have ambitions of you know fulfilling their postgraduate studies are supported, and so um, we felt it was necessary for SARS to be part and parcel of of of, of um, this conversation and to also uh, present um, to the portfolio committee their, their views and from there on we'll then go into discussions. Perhaps you should also note that um, those who will be um, presenting from SALS today will be part of the new leadership of SALS as SALS went to conference, national conference not so long ago in June if I'm not mistaken. Um, so having said that, I think we can go directly into um, the opening remarks by the DG um, as, as the DSI then presents to us. DG, we have about an hour um, or so for your presentation um, and then we'll move into South. So at around 10, um, 10, 15, um, I think that's when you will then hand over to South. Thanks, DG. Uh, uh Thanks very much, uh, Honourable um, Kacha, the chairperson, and congratulations on your on your new role. And we look forward to working and supporting uh, the committee in its uh, work. Also, um, the the whip, uh, Matlazi, Honourable Matlazi, and the honourable members of the committee that uh, we've been working with. So, congratulations. 
And then secondly, I realized that um, since the presentation would be done by the National Research Foundation, I think uh, Dr. Maharaj will be leading. There is a full team from the National Research Foundation. I saw uh, Mem Poletlape, I assume she's representing the board. I saw the uh, chief executive officer, uh, Dr. Nelo Amondo. I am not so sure, Honorable Mkatra, whether it's his first time uh, in the portfolio committee. Um, I do not remember uh, him being introduced properly, but maybe um, Paul Letlape, the board member, might want to do so. I've also seen uh, Dr. Gensen Pile from the NRF, as well as Dr. Petiwe Matutu as well. So I will hand over to them very, very quickly. But before I do so, the presentation contains three parts. The first part is the ministerial guidelines that the minister issued, uh, I think around about 2014 or 2015, uh, to assist uh, in uh, achieving equity within the national system of innovation. So this was a policy directive that was negotiated uh, with the NRF uh, and the minister issued these guidelines. So in the presentation, you will receive the background um, of the circumstances that led to the ministerial guidelines and hopefully also the performance uh, against these ministerial guidelines over the years uh, from the NRF. The second part is a postgraduate funding policy that tries to ensure that for needy students, um, there is full cost uh, of study. Funding is provided for the full cost of study. Uh, the background would be provided and of course, it does have implications uh, for um, the students that get this funding in the sense that uh, if the quantum of funding hasn't changed, if you provide full cost uh, to uh, the majority of recording of in students, progress, because when they work, they will have the tax numbers and the NRF would have their names. And then this is the work that I think uh, is in progress, but hopefully we'll now be in a better position to track and know where these students find the work uh, and whether in fact they are working. There have been some studies that seem to suggest that uh, students complete their degrees, but uh, they don't seem to be working. So we want to have evidence-based um, data and, and, and information to be able to respond to that question. So with, with that uh, introduction uh, through you, Honorable Chair, may I then ask, uh, um, um, Paul, if she wants to add anything from the board perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Phil. But our boss, the chairman of, of the board, uh, Dr. Oboka, is on the call, and I will defer to her to do the NRF. But thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much, um, Paul, and uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Phil. Uh, for the introductory remarks. Uh, also from our side, Honorable Chair, members of the committee, uh, the DG officials from DSI, members of the NRF board and the executive team from, uh, from NRF and members of South. Good morning and thanks very much for the opportunity afforded to the NRF to brief the committee on the progress made on the implementation of the DSI NRF postgraduate student policy, uh, funding policy. Chair, let me also take this opportunity and congratulate you and wish you all the best as, as you assume your new role as the chairperson of this committee. And we look forward to your leadership and guidance as you discharge your oversight responsibilities. I think just following up on what the DG has said, maybe key to note from the NRF presentation are also the challenges that we've experienced as NRF in funding all the eligible postgraduate students who applied under this policy in 2020, 2021, due to the funding constraints. And secondly, are the interventions and efforts to source additional funding for the students who could not be funded from this uh, first round. And I think importantly to note going forward are the projections from the budget 
uh, in terms of the requirements for the next five years to success successfully fund this important policy, which is really guided by the principles of equity in relation to access, success, throughput, and representativity. Thank you, Chair. I'll now hand over to the CEO to take us through the presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of the NRF Board and the Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee. Thank you very much. Let me just start by congratulating you on your appointment. And perhaps for myself, as a young person, I really feel very proud to see you being nominated uh, and being appointed to lead the Portfolio Committee. So congratulations are in order. Um, the presentation, as the DG has mentioned, will be led by Dr. Maharaj, who is the Executive Director for the Human and Infrastructure Capacity Development within the NRF. Um, I know that we have very limited time, so I want to introduce the team that I have uh, with me now. Uh, but perhaps at the end, when there are questions, when the, there are questions that they may need to answer, they will then introduce themselves. So without any further ado, uh, Honorable Chairperson, I will then like to hand over to Dr. Maharaj, who will take us through the presentation. Thank you. Romila. Thank you. Um, okay, I need permission to share the presentation. Um, whilst I'm getting that. Um, good morning. Um, can we, uh, we kindly make uh, Ms. Maharaj co-host to get sharing rights, please. The person is open to share. Just get this presentation up and running. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the PPC, um, DG, the NRF Board Chairperson, NRF CEO, DSI, and NRF colleagues. It's an honor to share with you this morning many years of work between the NRF, the DSI, and the system broadly in terms of postgraduate funding. I know that I have limited time, so I'm going to proceed directly with the presentation. In terms of the presentation outline, as DG um, Phil has indicated, um, I will cover briefly a background and share with you performance against the 2013 ministerial guidelines. Also, the work that we did in terms of the policy development that informed our policy options and our experience thus far with implementing the policy and also the financial modeling in terms of the future funding that is required. So we know that human capacity development is a strategic objective and a key area for development for us as a country in order to contribute to human capabilities and skills for the economy to drive innovation as well, for the provision of research and innovation infrastructure, increased knowledge generation and innovation outputs, development of priority science areas, and to promote citizens' engagement with science. To remind us, the mandate of the NRF is to contribute to the national development by firstly supporting, promoting and advancing research and human capacity development through developing, um, supporting and maintaining national research facilities, supporting and promoting public awareness of and engagement with science and promoting the development and maintenance of the national system and support of government priorities. 
The work that we have been doing between DSI and NRF, and of course with the science system broadly, is to contribute towards the 2030 NDP targets, which sets a target of having a current baseline of 25% of university enrollments to be having it to achieve 25% of university enrollments to be at that level. Our current baseline at 2017 is 14.5%. Our target is also to have 5,000 PhD graduates per annum and the 2018 baseline was 3,307. The target is also to have 75% of academic staff with PhD qualifications with a 2018 baseline of 45%. So how have we performed against the 2013 ministerial guideline targets? The ministerial guidelines were adopted in January 2013 and the fundamental principles underpin underpinning these guidelines were as follows. It included representativity, improved efficiencies and prioritization of science engineering and technology related disciplines likely to drive innovation. The equity targets set were 87% South African of which 80% should be black, 55% women, and 4% persons with disabilities. It also had a target of having to fund no more than 13% of international students. So we did achieve progress over the period, and the data that is presented here is from 2015 to 2019. There is a lag phase, but we ensure that we have clean data when we're presenting. So by 2019 academic year, we had achieved 92% of the honor students being um, black students. Eight at PhD level at 78%. And at the postdoctoral level, we have still have much work to do and that will probably require another policy to move that forward. With respect to female representation, by 2019, we had achieved 60% of honor students being funded being female, 61% at the master's level, 56% at the doctoral level, and lagging slightly behind with the, at the postdoctoral level at 53%. We also compare the NRF funded students that have graduated as a percentage of the total graduations from the HEMIS student graduation data. And while NRF funds has been funding in the past about 15% of students, we've seen at all three levels that we have consistently accounted for a much larger proportion of graduates at all three levels. For example, at the doctoral level, we accounted for 23% of doctoral graduates in 2018. We also have been following and comparing against the HEMIS data in terms of the red, black students that NRF funded uh, students have graduated and also women. And we see that uh, if we look at the latest data in 2018, NRF funded students that have graduated have been 74% against HEMIS, which is 59%. And for women, 54% of NRF funded graduates were, were women against 51% from the HEMIS data. Now, what I have presented to you was the students that have received bursaries or fellowships, in other words, people that are not in employment. And this data here, uh, we're sharing with you just to illustrate that we also support individuals that are knowledge workers employed in the public research institutions and public research, uh, public universities to obtain their doctoral degrees and to strengthen their research 
profile in the early years of having obtained uh, their PhD. So these are individuals that are employed at universities or public research institutions, and the funding that they get is largely in the form of research grants. In the case of the Black Academic Advancement Program, it includes funding for release time from teaching and from uh, administrative duties. So we see that what, what we're seeing in the last two, three years is that we're having more people, more interest in the Tutuka program at the post PhD level, which is indicating that more academics are achieving uh, their doctoral degrees and more applications at the Black Academic Advancement Program, which includes time release um, in the PhD track. In fact, in the past two years, we have seen that we have had 75% of new grant holders in the, in the Black Academic Advancement Program being in the PhD track. I will move on now to the development of the DSI NRF postgraduate funding policy. This policy gives effect to the ministerial guidelines um, that we have referred to, which was issued in 2013. And in formulating the, the postgraduate funding policy, the principles of equity of opportunity in relation to access, success, and throughput and representativity were adopted. And these principles are underpinned by the pursuit of research excellence in all of its dimensions. So what were some of the challenges we were trying to address? Firstly, was the low progression rates from honors to masters to doctoral studies. The long time to completion and advanced age of completion. Many studies have shown that on average, South African doctoral graduates were in their 40s, whereas compared internationally, the majority of people obtain their PhDs between the age of 25 and 35. We're also focusing on transformation of the postgraduate cohort, particularly at the master's and doctoral levels where we had not achieved that 80% as yet. And very importantly, the bursary values were not comprehensive and inadequate to cover for cost of study. We also looked at funding financially needy students at all postgraduate levels and to also look at some synergy with NSFAS funding for undergraduate students. So these are some of the interventions that we're aiming for. Firstly, postgraduate students um, will be funded without interruption up to the doctoral level. In other words, if they pass um, the the honors degree in the required time and meet the academic requirements, they'll be first in line for a master's degree and similarly first in line uh, for doctoral degree studies. We will prioritize full-time studies because we've seen time and time again that um, students that have pursue postgraduate studies on a full-time basis complete it much sooner. We've also set age limits for doctoral completion by the age of 35. Um, and as I've said, we're looking at the funding uh, pipeline for NSFAS fund funded students, but also ISFAP funded students. We have a partnership with ISFAP in this regard. We're looking at fit for purpose financial packages. Financially needy students will be those uh, at the financially needy students those with a disability, and those that are exceptional academic achievers will be funded at full cost of study, and all other students, including international students, will be funded at partial cost of studies. We've also increased the equity targets compared to the ministerial guidelines, um, and 95% of the awards will be allocated to South African citizens and permanent residents with just 5% to international students, including ZADAC students. And 90% will be allocated to South African Black and 55% will be allocated to women students. We're also looking at alignment with the DHET undergraduate bursary scheme for students at public universities. 
So this policy took a long time in the making. It, we started off in 2016 by gathering data. Um, the universities through USAF uh, assisted us with compiling a database of 62,000 students that we had funded over a five-year period. And we analyzed that cohort to inform our policy options. In 2017 to 19, we went through the development phase. By March 2019, the policy had been approved by the board and um, we opened the first, first call for applications in 2020. In May 2020, the minister in some Monday um, endorsed the policy as the DSI NRF postgraduate funding policy. And the first cohort of students were approved for funding in December last year to commence their studies this year. The honors students were approved in March this year because largely because of the pandemic, the academic year was extended. We also put out a second call for applications this year. And a key change in the implementation of this policy, and this was a strong requirement through ISFAP from in order to secure private sector funding to supplement um, postgraduate funding was that a, si a single annual report from our postgraduate students was inadequate. So we have introduced a biannual reporting and that's also to be able to pick up early interventions if students are struggling. So one of the things that we analyzed was to look at the completion pattern of the NRF funded students over a five year period. And we found that we had at the honors level a completion average completion rate of 82%, 70 at the masters and 61 at the doctoral. Um, the average completion within the NRF funding period, which is one, two, and three years, was just under 60% for honors, just under 70% for masters, and PhD students sometimes take longer, but we found that 25% finished within their last year of funding, and another 70% finished within the next three years. And in terms of how this compares with other studies, um, we have a 40 to 82 percent um, um, completion for NRF, whereas uh, the Moton study showed that 40 percent of honors students take as long as three years to complete their degrees. Um, in terms of the broader system, only 25 percent of master's students complete within four years and 25% and of doctoral students complete within five years. So what this is telling us is that we do have a better success rate with the NRF funded students. We also looked at um, the throughput rate for NRF funded postgraduate students compared uh, with the national norms. And you can see that at all three levels, um, the NRF completion rate compared uh, very uh, favorably with um, the national average and in fact exceeded it. So honors, for example, the average NRF completion rate was just under 1.2, whereas the national average was three years. Similarly for masters, just over two years for NRF, five years is the average and about 3.4 years for at the doctoral level, whereas the national average is seven, seven years. We also looked at the average age of completion of uh, NRF uh, funded students. And we found that at honors level, the, the average was 25 years, 27 at masters and 33 at the doctoral levels compared to the national average being 30, 34, and 41. As I've indicated earlier, we also looked at the proportion of the total graduates compared to the proportion of students that we fund. So in the case of honors, although we funded only 6% of honors students, we accounted for 12% of graduates. Similarly, at the master's level, we funded 8% of master's students, but graduated 90%. And at the doctoral level, we funded 16% and 
and we funded 35% of the students. So one of the criterion that we, or policy choices that we've made in putting together this policy was to set um, minimum age at application for NRF postgraduate funding in order to steer the system to renew and replenish the aging cohort that we have uh, of researchers and scholars. So we have set ma maximum age at application for honors at 28, masters 30 and doctoral at 32 with the view to having more people complete their PhDs by the age of 35. So what also guided this policy option other than the NRF average age at completion was to look at the proportion of students uh, graduating and at what age were they graduating. So we see that there is a huge pool. The highest frequency of undergraduates is at 21 years. So even if uh, an individual were to take time off to, to raise children, family responsibilities, gain some work experience, there is still a window period between the age of 21 and 28 to enter the postgraduate pipeline. One of the other things that we were concerned about is that we didn't see large numbers of students that we had been funding through the pipeline. Um, from undergraduate to postgraduate up to the doctoral level. So of this cohort of 62,000 students that we had funded, we analyzed and we found that um, there, were, there was only 1.4% that we had funded from, from honors to masters to doctoral. There was only just under 8% that were funded for honors and masters and only about 5% that were funded at master's and doctoral. So that is why one of the policy options that we have taken is that we will fund students uninterrupted to go through from uh, honest through to doctoral degree. We also um, looked at the academic requirements um, for uh, postgraduate funding. And we looked at the pool of students that were achieving different grades. And we were, we were comfortable from this data that there was certainly a large enough a pool of African colored and Indian students for them not to be excluded by us setting academic uh, requirements. And in fact, the data we have this year with the proportion of students that we were unable to fund due to lack of funding uh, confirms this. I mentioned earlier that we had to look at the, the, the values of the scholarships. Now, over the past few years, we have been focusing on increasing the number of students that we were funding without increasing adequately the budget. So we found that we were lagging behind national norms for funding at the different levels. And so we had to take a policy decision and make changes to rectify this, knowing that with an unchanged budget in the short term, we will be funding fewer students. So if we compared what on average, what uh, or a higher value honors bursary from the NRF was at in 2019, it was only 60,000, just about enough to cover fees. And if we compare that with NSFAS, SFAP, the square kilometer area undergraduate and honors bursaries, CSIR undergraduate and honors bursaries, we see that those were range from 112 to 155. So we knew we knew that the bore mark was around 150, but we went through uh, an exercise of calculating what it should be. Similarly, when we compared uh, the master's and doctoral funding, master's funding was at 90,000 compared to CSIR at 170. 
and doctoral funding was at 120 compared to CSIR doctoral at 190. So this policy has addressed full and partial cost of study and what does it cost for full cost of study? I'll move on then to the implementation of the postgraduate funding policy. Um, just to show you how we have changed the equity targets against the ministerial guidelines, the initial ministerial guidelines of 2013 had set a target of 87% South African students to be funded. We have increased that, as I have said, to 95%. Um, we've also increased the proportion of black students to be funded from 80 to 90%. We retain the, the women at 55%, knowing that women make up 50% of the population, but we felt that we should keep that higher. We have adjusted the target for students with disabilities. We have consistently never received applications of less than 1% of applications with, from students with disabilities. Um, we set 1%, which we think is still a stretch target, target, but more realistic. We've also see it as a target that can be increased over time towards achieving that target of having 2% of the workforce being persons with a disability uh, in the future. So this slide shows us uh, a breakdown of the student applications that we received and that we approved for this year. So we received uh, from the universities a total of just 12,400 applications. There was a percentage that were incomplete applications, missing documents, et cetera. That's, that's a normal that happens in all calls. And the key thing to focus on is that we funded 5,198 students, 42% um, so of the fundable students are what we funded. And there were 48% of the students that we could not fund. Now, these are students that meet quite, that meet academic criteria of having achieved 65% in their previous degree, students that have been reviewed by the universities and recommended for funding for the university, by the university. So we see, um, we have, and if we compare here, against the enrollment figures, it shows you what a small proportion of students the NRF is funding. So we have 83,000 enrolled for honors. We only funded just about 2,700. We have 63,000, uh, almost 64,000 enrolled for masters. We have funded about 2,000. And we have about 24,000 uh, registered for doctoral degrees. Um, and we have um, only funded um, a, a very small proportion of that. Admittedly, about 50% of these are in employment. So when we were predicting how many students we would be able to fund given a, a, a flatlined budget of just over a billion rand for postgraduate students, we predicted that we would end up with about 70% of students requiring full cost of study funding and 30% a partial cost of study. Um, in reality, uh, based on students that were recommended and were approved, 62% uh, are at full cost of study at the honors level that, and 38% at partial cost. At the master's level, it increases to 58% at full cost uh, and 42% at partial cost and at the doctoral level. So this is already indicating to us that we have a higher demand uh, for full cost of study um, at the um, doctoral level. But this is just the first year, so we would need data for a few years to really be able to see trends. 
um, to share with you um, the breakdown of the students that we have funded. Now, these are just students that we have funded under the new postgraduate funding policy, first year, a first cohort being in this year, and it excludes continuing students that would have been funded um, under the previous um, guidelines. So we have uh, funded 87% South African citizens, 8% permanent residents, 5% international, and 87% black and 60% female. So we are quite close to that 90% and we expect over the next two years to achieve that. We also share with you um, the proportion of students um, that we have funded in STEM and in the social sciences and humanities. We have, uh, under the ministerial guidelines, had a target of funding 70 to 80% of our students in the STEM disciplines, as these have been areas in which we have had lower proportions of doctoral graduates. And you can see um, that in the STEM funded students at the honors level were 72%, 75 at masters and 81% at the doctoral level. So honorable members, this is an important slide that we want to share with you. Um, these are postgraduate students recommended for funding that could not uh, be funded due to budget constraints. Um, and uh, there's five, just about 5,200 South African uh, citizens and just under 500 permanent residents, uh, a smaller proportion of international students. And you will see that 75% of them are Black and female. So we have a huge cohort here of students that meet all the criteria um, that we are unable to fund this year due to budget constraints. So just again, as a reminder to show you um, how we have increased uh, the bursary values compared to what we were funding previously. Previously, we did not fund at full and partial cost of study, but for the purposes of comparison, I've used the old bursary values. Um, so the students that received a higher value bursary for honors would have received 60,000. The new maximum value is now just under 150. Masters would have been 90. It's closer to 170 now. Doctoral would have been 120. It's about 175. And those students that were receiving really low bursary values um, under the old guidelines, those that were receiving 30,000 are compared against the partial cost, which is 100,000, and also at master's level, 50,000 compared to 100,000 at partial cost and 70,000 for doctoral compared to 90,000. Now you'll see that in all cases, except at the doctoral level, a partial cost of study bursary is lower. And the reason for that is the, the fees drops as you go from honest through to the doctoral level. So as expected, the impact of the policy, given that the budget is flatlined, uh, is that there is a significant decrease in the number of students. But as I have said, we have had to make this choice in order to rectify these low uh, bursary values. One of the other challenges that we have faced is that we have had been receiving a declining budget from the National Skills Fund for postgraduate students. Um, and this was at just over 250 million in the 1617 financial year, and it has reduced to 151 million this year, which further reduces the number of students that we can fund. We have entered into an agreement with ISFAP 
for two reasons. One, ISFAP is our partner to undertake the means test for students that require a means test. And secondly, for ISFAP to be able to raise funding from private sector for postgraduate funding. And this private sector funding would then be channeled through ISFAP and we would co-fund um, with, NR, with NRF, DSI funding and leverage additional funding in that way. So we have been applying our minds to options of increasing funding under this very uh, challenging times of a global pandemic. The DSI did have reprioritized funding of just over 9 million. And we decided to invest that in extension support for masters and doctoral students that had been affected by the pandemic last year and that required additional funding to complete their degrees this year. Um, we've also um, sent a submission to DSI indicating that prior to making the awards for honors students, we had a shortfall of just under 300 million, which would have allowed us to fund another almost 2000 students. And um, in May this year, uh, our board chair um, sent a communication to the honorable chairperson of the PPC. So currently, um, as we stand, um, these are the students that could not be funded due to budget constraints. And um, some of these students would have gone, would have applied for funding and would have gone ahead and registered for postgraduate studies, even though they did not receive funding from the NRF, they may have received funding uh, from other sources. Um, in total, we have students that are eligible for full cost of study amounting to just under 3,800 requiring um, 590 million. And we have just under 1,800 students eligible for partial cost of study that would require about another 174 million. We've also done some modeling uh, looking at what will we require to be able to fund the same number of students that we were funding um, prior to the introduction of uh, this policy. And uh, we had a budget of uh, just over 1 billion grant. We did this modeling, assuming a 6% inflationary increase um, to all our students. We assumed that 50% of the students would want to progress from honors through to masters to doctoral we assume 70% to be at partial cost, uh, to be at full cost of study and 30% at partial cost. And um, so in 2021, um, we have funded, um, eight, uh, we project funding 8,000, just over 8,000 students. Given that we have to bring into this um, the inflationary increases and that at the moment we have a proportion of our students that are funded, are continuing students funded at the lower levels. As we start to fund more students at full cost of study, if we have this budget that's flatlined, by the year 2025, we will only be able to fund about 6,000 students. So this shows us what it would what would be required to take us back to the 1819 uh, uh, funding levels where in 2018-19 we funded about 13,600 students and we we have modeled here if we were to increase by 10 percent down to 69 percent uh, the funding requirements that we will need. So as I've said, at the moment, we have a budget of just over a billion rand. We would require more like 1.8 billion rand in order to be able to fund the same number of students that we were funding 
in the 2018-19 financial year. A number of studies have been undertaken uh, tracking the impact of doctoral graduates and uh, commissioned by the DSI, USAF, uh, Water Research Commission, etc. And um, a very recent study that is being finalized is a cross-sectional uh, PhD tracer study being undertaken by Professor Moton and his team. And this traces individuals that graduated between 2002 to 2018. What is comforting to see is that the vast majority, 80 to 92% of South African graduates indicated that they are satisfied with their decision to pursue a doctorate, that their degree has been in the right field, it's turned out to be a good investment and their expectations have been met. We also found that the study is also indicating that the vast majority of South African doctoral graduates are employable with a very small proportion, only 2.3%, who could not find employment immediately following completion of their studies. This study also is looking at uh, the employment status of the graduates before and after completing their doctoral degree. And what it shows is that the majority of the students over the past 20 years were already employed when they enrolled for their doctoral degrees. It's not surprising, given that we had a very low proportion of academics and researchers in the public research institutions that needed to obtain their PhDs. And the majority of the graduates have remained with the same employer since obtaining their degrees. The study also looked at movement of um, individuals after obtaining their degrees and, and the majority were, were employed in the higher education sector and have remained in the sector. And in fact, there's been a net gain of 5% of doctoral graduates by, by the higher education sector. And this is going um, somewhat towards addressing the target that we have for having 75% of university academic staff having PhDs. One of the other things that the study looked at is to see whether we were losing people, whether there was a net loss or gain of brain gain, or do we call it brain circulation, uh, which is encouraged in academic endeavors. And of a cohort of just under 4,000 graduates who were born in South Africa, 9.2% left the country after graduation. Just over 1,800 who came from outside the country. And of these, 35% remained in the country. So it translates to a net gain of um, 260 graduates uh, in the sample. So in closing, honorable members, uh, one of the challenges that we've had is that we have not been able to track our researchers um, and particularly our postgraduate students because we have not been able to track them post their completion of their degree. And we're pleased to announce that we, uh, NRF, DSI and SARS are close to reaching an agreement that will grant the NRF access to limited taxpayers information which means that uh, students can be tracked as they enter the workforce. The NRF is also uh, developing a digital platform that will allow for tracking of the socioeconomic impact of graduates as they enter employment and other economic uh, factors. I thank you for listening. DG, would you like to make any closing remarks? No, nothing, Chairperson, uh, nothing at all. Thank you. Unless maybe uh, the, on, the chair of the NRF wants to add anything on our side, fine. Thank you. Um, chair, would you like to add anything on your side? 
No, thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair. I think we are also fine from our side. I think the presentation really, you know, gave a sense of the challenges as well as the projections that we want to also engage with the committee on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to colleagues from the DSI and the NRF. I'll now hand over to colleagues from the South African Union of Students to make their presentation. Can we please make sure they have sharing rights unless they have requested that the Secretariat shares on their behalf? Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. I'm not sure if I'm audible enough, Chair. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We'd also like to see you. Okay, Chair, you will see me. Can you see me, Chair? Yeah. We can see yeah. you. Um, and then the, the, the presentation, are, are you flighting it yourself or? Um, yes, like can I? It? I want to, let me try and share. Okay. Yes, can you see it, Chair? We can see it. Okay, yes. Thank you. Uh, firstly, Chair, let me congratulate you. Uh, on your, on your appointment as the chair of the portfolio committee. It means then as young people who are on the right track in terms of the youth takeover, uh, probably in the next uh, reshuffle in government by the president, we will hear your name then the minister. So we are hoping that you are taking that direction. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, the portfolio committee chair for inviting us as the union uh, it is a very important uh, platform for us as the union to present and make sure that the student struggles are advanced. So we were very happy to be invited uh, in, the, in, the, in the portfolio committee. Uh, Chair, firstly, I, I think because we are a new NEC, we, we need to introduce ourselves. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the 25th of June, it was 28th in the University of Venda, the Union of Students, uh, went into a conference where the officials were elected, uh, myself being the president, Kungisya uh, Taban Kunyane being the team president, uh, Luka Nyotaweti being the, the, the secretary general, Moses Kambako being the deputy, and uh, Mutiara Jonas being the treasurer. Now, now, Chair, part of the discussions that were, were dominant in the, in, in the conference was that we must continue to grow uh, SAO's true stakeholder engagement. So we very much appreciate uh, us having to be part of this uh, committee. We appreciate uh, this opportunity of engaging with other stakeholders, your NRF and many other stakeholders. We've always uh, viewed this committee, the progressive committee, uh, from the work that it has done, even from last year uh, in, in our previous administration. We've always appreciated uh, being part of this committee. So uh, even uh, today, uh, we much appreciate uh, being invited here. As part of preeminent, I think in the presentation by, by uh, NRF, it did give a highlight to say that the government through its uh, NTP, they have a plan that they have, they have adopted one uh, to increase the research output in South Africa and ultimately increase the number of uh, PhD holders. Uh, as the baseline, uh, this, uh, this is according to the report issued by the department. In 2016, there were 2,797 uh, total graduates produced by the public institution, which was 10%, 10.6 more than the 2015 uh, PhD uh, candidates produced. So we, we, we had a target then of uh, 12,000 PhD graduates uh, in South Africa, meaning that Institute of Higher Learning were looking at to produce it about uh, 5,000 PhD uh, graduates uh, per annum. Also, Chair, in line with the, with the plan and the vision to produce the number of PhD, uh, you have to then assess the number of students registered in the sector and the number of students that are dependent on government funding. So it, as, as confirmed by the board, Chair Fenerswas, this year, out of the one uh, 0.6 million students registered about in the universities, about 1.2 of those students are funded by NSFAS, meaning that you have a large number 
of students who are in the system that are dependent on government funding. So for, for us to realize the dream of those PhD, we are largely dependent on making sure that the students fund by government do make it uh, to the funding stream, be it your NRF or a private donor and other funding uh, streams that are available. So that's, that's number one. Now we have to look at the source of funding uh, available uh, for students. Uh, many students uh, depend on NSFAS for their undergraduate funding. Also, NSFAS administers a number of passages. I think there are more than eight passages that are administered by NSFAS, your TRC, DMV, DST, CITAS, and other CITAS that are, are monitored by NSFAS. But now all these passages and funding streams monitored by NSFAS, none of them uh, funds uh, the, the postgraduate qualifications. Mainly students depend on NRF for, 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 for postgraduate uh, funding. That is from your honors and PhD and post uh, qualification. Now you don't uh, have any funding stream between uh, your, 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 your undergraduate qualification and uh, postgraduate. So you, they start from honors and RF to fund moving forward. Now the challenges that we have uh, that give us a problem as uh, students in, in the sector now. There is a replacement now of BTEC uh, qualifications with advanced diploma qualifications across uh, all universities in South Africa. Now, if you if you go to NSFAS for funding, NSFAS will then say, if you are doing an advanced diploma, you are a post-grad student. But if you go to NRF to apply as an advanced diploma student, NRF will tell you that according to the NRF policy, you are an undergrad student. Meaning that now if you do a diploma, you are going to have a bridge that you can cross, which is an advanced diploma stage where both NSFAS and NRF does not fund. Now, meaning that students who will be doing diplomas are ultimately falling out of the post-grad uh, 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 ambitions because they, 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 they are not funded as a form of the bridge. Now, this is a, because of the replacement of the PTEC by Institute of Higher Learning. Remember, PTEC at some point was at the same NTF level with, with honors. So NRF could fund at some point the, the, the PTEC. But now since institutions are replacing PTEC, it then means that there's a problem in terms of, uh, of, of, share, of, of, of funding uh, that, that, that particular stream. Also, uh, Chair, there is a change of qualifications in terms of uh, qualification codes in the Institute of Higher Learning. And some of the qualifications that have been uh, introduced are not, yet intro, uh, are not yet introduced or adopted by both NSFAS and NRF. For an example, there's, there was a, a, a discussion now at NSFAS of uh, the LLB uh, qualification not being funded by NSFAS and the LLM as well being a challenge in terms of being funded at NRF. So we have those challenges that students are facing as, as, as a crisis. Also, the other problem that we're facing is the defunding of the PGC by NSFAS. Now, most students, what they, they will do after they do their, their undergrad qualifications, because they can't now transcend to a, a post-grad qualification, they will normally take the root of the PGCE where they then get a funding from NSFAS to a PGCE, and the PGCE is an NGF level higher than the diplomas they will do. So after the PCE, they will then get funding into post-grad and proceed with their studies. Now, this year, NSFAS then took a decision to defund uh, the PCE, of which a number of students across uh, uh, the sector are complaining about this decision. Now, beyond the postgraduate uh, interest of students having to uh, transcend into ac academic studies, there is a crisis of uh, jobs in, in, in the market in South Africa. Now students, because of the qualification they tend to do, they on the way want to take a U-turn and go to a space of educators through the PTCE, of which now NSFAS have closed that gap because they, because they are saying that there's not enough funding for them to fund a PTC, of which the discussion, an ongoing discussion that we've had with NSFAS who are still continuing to engage with the minister and, and other relevant stakeholders, making sure that those students are, are not closed out. 
Now, the other point that we want to raise as a union, it's a, it's a, it's a cross bridge to the next NQF level. You know, how do, we, how do we then close that gap? Because you have a crisis where some qualifications are not in the same level as in terms of the NQF as the qualifications funded by, by NRF. So we, we have that crisis that we wanted to, to raise. Also, there is an exclusion of a PTTA a qualification by both NSFAS and NRF. Now, that's a crisis that students are facing because they don't have funding uh, for, for, for those uh, programs. So they are, they, are, they are stuck there. You find that students, because they don't get funding, they tend to go and stay at home because of the challenges that, that they are facing. So that's what we're raising. Now, we, these are the points that we want to raise, Chair. Uh, I think uh, NRF in this presentation give a detailed, uh, they give a detail, they gave a detailed uh, presentation on the crisis faced by NRF in terms of, 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 of funding students. Number one, we think that government must allocate more funding as you, can, as you have seen in the presentation by, by NRF that uh, there are more than 5,000 students that have not been funded. In, in fact, they are qualifying to be funded, but they are not funded by NRF because there is no uh, insufficient funds in terms of funding those students. So we were calling on government to say that we must start investing in funding more uh, students through NRF and making sure that we increase the research output and that will be the route into increasing uh, the PhD holders. Uh, in, in, in South Africa. Looking at the numbers presented uh, in the sector, in the, in the document by, by the, 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 the department in 2016, you, you have about 83,000 students enrolled in, in, in the sector at the, at, at the postgraduate level now. But students that have stable funding out of those students, they are less than 3,000. Part of the stable funding that I'm talking about is NRF, of which part of them, they don't fund those students fully. You'll find that the student is funded only for tuition, but they don't, they're not funded for, for, for accommodation and, and, and allowances, which really gives a challenge to students in terms of, of, of um, progressing and doing academically well in the institution. Also, Chair, and as far as the, the second point, NSFAS must fund students according to the NQF levels so that we close the gap. It can be that say, when you are funding one qualification, you are funding up to a degree level, which is an NQF level higher than a diploma because it then disadvantages students who are doing diplomas. A student who's doing a diploma, they are going to encounter a bridge of the advanced diploma stage where they can't pass uh, to honors and ultimately to the PhD. So NSFAS must start changing. In fact, drafting a policy to say that they are going to fund students according to the NQF level. If you apply as a student, they must say we are going to fund you up until NQF level eight or NQF level seven, so that they give you a way so that you can be able to access uh, the NRF funding at the honors program and moving forward. The third point that we want to raise here is that NSFAS must reinstate the PGC if funding because uh, that was cut with immediate effect. Because currently, there are more than 5,000 students that have been crying to NSFAS because of the, of the cutting of the PHCE funding. And the PHCE as a qualification was serving as a bridge from undergrad qualification to the postgrad qualification and funding for students. So the cutting of the PHCE <clears throat> actually saying in, the, in essence that students are going to be trapped at the, at the undergrad qualifications without having access to funding from, from NRF. <clears throat> so I want to encourage uh, NSFAS to, 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 to open that funding stream, uh, reinstate that funding so that those students are able uh, to, 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 to proceed. We, we had an engagement with the, with the board chair and the CEO of NSFAS to say that let's quantify uh, this, prog uh, this problem of the PGCE. Let's see how much is it and how then can we seek interventions? Probably, Chair, in the, in the near future, we will come to this committee to make that presentation so that you can be able to assist us as this, uh, as this portfolio committee uh, to, to, to convince uh, the, the government, to convince uh, private uh, donors to fund 
this this program of PhD. Also, uh, the student debt is an issue for postgraduate students because we believe that the student debt institutions should not be uh, affecting student debts, blocking students while students are still ready to start uh, and they are not working. There are students who are not yet employed who are still uh, in the institute of learning. They are ready to start, but already institutions they are sending those uh, students. Uh, to, to, to lawyers for collection and, uh, and, and all those things. They are blocking their accounts. They are, they are handing over their accounts to, to debt collectors. So we're saying that there must be a position to say that students that are enrolled in postgraduate uh, studies, their debt must not be effective in terms of, of, of debt collecting. Their debt must only start uh, being the active in, a, in, a, in, in, in their work, in their plot of, 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 of work. Also, it does not serve a purpose uh, to, to, to start collecting a debt of, to a person that is unemployed. A person, by the way, that was funded by NSFAS in their undergraduate program. And because of this advanced diploma crisis, they are not funded. They, they, they find themselves uh, in a debt. And then when they want to enroll in a postgraduate qualification, they have a debt now that they are facing and they can't be able to enroll. So we're saying that as, as the union, Students that were funded by NSFAS in their undergraduate qualification and are still enrolling for, for, for postgraduate qualification must be funded and must be registered without any hiccups in terms of the debt that they owe. Because we funded them as NSFAS, understanding that they are not able to fund themselves, they don't afford to fund. So it doesn't make sense now when we say them, they must pay uh, out in, in the postgraduate funding. As the last two points, Chair, we think that uh, government must find means to compel the private sector to inject uh, funding in the postgraduate study. Because remember, Chair, uh, private sector as well, they are beneficiaries of the, of, of the education uh, that government is investing in, because the labor force will be educated and literate to be able to service the needs of the private sector. Now, government must start having those engagements with private sector to say that, how do you then come into the picture and assist us as the country in building a more uh, educated society and increasing the research output in terms of reproduction of knowledge? So we want to say government must, must uh, introduce new means of compelling private sector to inject funding into, into, into postgrad studies. Also, Chair, as the last point that we want to raise, is that universities also must start coming into the picture in terms of, of, of funding uh, performing students who are enrolling for postgrad. We know that in some institutions, uh, the institution is able to set out uh, funding for students who are academically performing. We want to encourage this uh, through this committee, through government, through USAF to say that all institutions must assist uh, students that are not uh, academic, uh, that are not academically struggling, students that are academically performing and they are doing well and who want to enroll in the postgraduate studies. Those students must, must be assisted, uh, Chair. One thing that Chair must be understood by all of us is that the job market now has changed and it is highly competitive. There are a large number of unemployed graduates in, 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 the, in the market. Now, for anyone and for any individual to compete in the job market, individuals need to increase their academic uh, qualifications. Individuals need to invest more in their education. So as, as part of responding to the challenges that uh, young people are facing of unemployment, government must invest more in education. You know that last year there was some, there was some budget cut from higher education we, we want to say that we will not accept that in the near future and government must start uh, investing uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in higher education so that we're able to respond uh, to, to the challenges uh, faced by, by, by young people of unemployment. I think uh, in, in, in large and in summary, NRF did share as, as a brief summary the crisis that the sector is facing in terms of, of, of the lack of funding for postgraduate students. So we need to start now shaping discussions and setting policies that will assist in making sure that we find more students. Uh, thank you very much, Chair.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President. And um, congratulations as well on your um, election as, as, as the new uh, NEC of, of South. And we wish you comrades all the best. And we truly look forward to having a healthy relationship with yourselves as we did um, with the previous leadership of South. Honorable members, those are the two presentations we have from the NRF uh, of the DSI, as well as the South African Union of Students. Can we begin to note hands of members who would like to engage on these presentations? While I um, await hands, I see Honorable Mananiso's hand is up. Perhaps I should um, just uh, indicate a few of the uh, thoughts that I have on my side. Um, firstly, could um, could uh, could 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 you clarify, DG and leadership of the NRF, on the on the fifth of May, twenty twenty one, the department presented its twenty twenty one twenty twenty two annual performance plan to the committee and indicated on slide twenty two that finalizing the transformation framework to strengthen the department's transformation agenda was one of its planned policy interventions for the current financial year. Could you clarify if um, um, that is the, the transformation framework as referenced by the department and the NRF the same or is it uh, are those separate initiatives? And at what stage of development um, draft or final is the transformation framework? And um, if these um, if separate initiatives, if if these are separate initiatives, could you explain how these frameworks um, relate uh, or converge? And then um, the other question that I had from my side is on slide uh, seven of the um, of of the presentation from the department and the NRF. Um, could you explain to us what exactly informed the equity targets that are displayed there? And then. Um, on slide 22, um, do you have, do you perhaps any, you know, have any recent data? I can't remember seeing on the, on the presented, um, on the projected presentation, if that was um, changed by any chance. Um, uh, I might have missed that slide. So can, can we just have confirmation of that? And then I think on, on slide 23, I found something very interesting and, and, and I'd really appreciate the department to, um, to do further research with regards to this. So if you look at the academic performance of financially uh, needy honors applicants, and, I, and I, I, I also would like to perhaps challenge us if there's no alternative words or word we could use as opposed to financially needy. So that the needy part, could we not perhaps refer to financially deserving students? Um, I don't know if that conversation has taken place as we continue to draft uh, this new uh, policy or model, because I, I don't know how, and you know, we can all engage this on, 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 our, on, 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 um, I don't know, the nuances around the word needy when we refer to financially deserving students. Um, and even when we refer to exceptional, I think we refer to exceptional achievers. Um, yeah, I don't know if we can play around with those words. Um, but just going back, so if we, if we look at that slide 23, academic performance of financially deserving honors applicants in 2017, it's very interesting to see how um when you when you look at uh um students of 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 the white population many of them um the highest bar they would have them achieving at 75 percent and above academically and then when you look at um the collective of of, of african students um majority of them are achieving at 60 to 64 percent and and with the majority with the the least of them achieving um, at 75 percent and above and I think um, perhaps if the department and the NRF could just assist us in making those sort of that, that sort of analysis on how could we get um, the, the the mustard bar to be higher when 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 looking at um, African students and and their academic performance um, 
And then um, I, I'd like to then move on to um, the ratio. So what is the ratio of students who will be funded as exceptional achievers um, and those funded as financially deserving? So what's, do we, is there any intentional sort of division of how many should we take as, as, as exceptional achievers and how many should we take as financially deserving? Um, and then could we just have clarity on who falls under other? Just clarity on that, please. And then I'd like to also find out what exactly informs the age limit. Because um, I mean, if you think of NASFIS, NASFIS doesn't necessarily have an age limit. So I don't know in terms of the demand. Um, I mean, I think as honorable members, we do get requests from people who would fall out of these age limits that have presented at the various postgraduate levels. And so how do we manage that? And, and how certain are we that, um, you know, opportunity could be given to, to, to people who fall out of these age limits by other entities, in, either within the DSI or within um, higher education by institutions of higher learning or any other government departments or, 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 or private sector entities that seek to assist people in funding. So I don't know if we're not perhaps creating greater barriers for some pockets of, 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 of uh, you know, um, South Africans who may want to further their studies and may not have done so for very various reasons. You know, I mean, we've seen how, you know, there are those few students who come into the 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 the, the system at 35, and that that's that's only when they're beginning their undergraduate studies. So I don't know what exactly informs the, the age limits, and if we've done more research on that in particular. Um, and then, did we make an analysis of what the most costly um, qualification could be at our public institutions for each of these um, very so for the qualifications at the various levels of postgraduate study. So at honors, which institution, um, what what is the most expensive honors course one could do in a public institution in South Africa? Um, and I ask this because um, we really want there's a there's a there's a there's a, a sentiment in the space that some of you know these um, qualifications that can give you skills that are really rare um, are often so uh, costly, um, which does not allow for us to see the type of transformation that we want to see, right? So where a young girl from Itutra wants to go and do I don't know astronomy or something like that. Um, because it's already when I was at WITS, I don't know now, but when I was at WITS, it was one of the most um, you know costly qualifications we had. Um, you don't want them to be to be limited because they are on government funding and they don't have um, you know the the financial um, um, muscle to be able to 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 go into that space. Therefore, transforming that space as well. Um, and then just clarity on whether or not. We, so it seems as though there's funding for the, the minimum period. So if you're doing your honors, you have funding for one year. If you're doing your master's one year, two, sorry, two years. If you're doing um, your, your PhD, it's three years. Um, have we made an analysis? I mean, I think noting the budget constraints, we're very well aware of the fact that we would, we would you know, really like to have a system where people are completing the qualifications within um, the minimum time because we don't have funding to, 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 to allow for, you know, additional, additional years. Um, but have we made an analysis of um, whether or not the funding we give or our, the beneficiaries of the NRF are able to complete their studies within the given time? Um, and then if we look at government's targets in terms of um, the amount of young people it wants to, or the amount of uh, you know, students, uh, graduates, it wants to produce per annum um, through, you know, particularly in postgraduate studies. Um, have we made an analysis of how, how, how much support is then given by the NRF to that? So looking at government's targets, um, how much support does NRF provide and then cover thereof? Um, it's also really great to see that, um, brain drain is being uh, managed within our country it seems like we're not losing too many young people looking at the, the the slides towards the end which is i think a really good thing 
And then I think it's very important that we increase mobility towards government and business. I think too many people are staying within higher education and that defeats the purpose of how we want, you know, science and innovation not to be a science and innovation thing. Um, research to not be a, an academia, a matter of academia, um, but really be able to use the skills and knowledge that are harnessed within the space of, 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 of academia. To, to, to influence um, you know, change and, and, and progress within government, but also in business as well. And then on slide 36, um, if we were to cover all, so slide 36 basically you know, tells us um, uh, the amount of uh, PhD students who could not be funded due to budget constraints. Um, if, if, if we were to fund, if we didn't have budget constraints, how 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 what what number of contribution would this be to government's targets in terms of the amount of um, young people that it wants to see in postgraduate studies? And then um, I think lastly, just um, you know, we 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 raised on a number of occasions as the portfolio committee how important it is for us. Um, to see a sort of centralization of funding in postgraduate studies. And I think it's something we also um, mentioned with undergraduate studies to say, if we were to um, centralize funding in a sense that all these bursaries that have been given by various government departments and even private sector and organizations, if we try to put them all in one piggy bank, um, you know, would that give us a better understanding of the amount of resource that we have and therefore be able to you know, um, afford it accordingly to more students. Um, I mean, we find many scenarios where a student will apply for a private bursa, also apply for NASFAS, and then, you know, both of them would respond. And I don't, I'm not of the view that the releasing, when the student then decides to take the one funding, so let's say NASFAS funding, I'm not of the view that the funding, let's say from a, a, a company or private sector or whatever, is released quick enough for another deserving student to then get that funding. I don't think the turnover time in terms of how we're able to then, you know, say, okay, Nompendulo got this funding, so who else could, could we then get? That turnover time, I think, is not as quick as it should be in order for more students to be covered. So I think the centralizing of these funds into one bank, you know, maybe the NRF could be the ones who, who, who administer funding for postgraduate studies. Um, across government, I think maybe that could assist us in making sure that more people are assisted. So that's about it from my side. I see there are many hands that have gone up this morning, which is really a good sign. Um, also from, uh, you know, from, from various political parties. So we're really excited uh, for that. We did miss your voice, uh, Honorable Marquesi. So we're, we're looking forward to the inputs that you'll be making. So noted as uh, Honorable Mananiso, Honorable Boshoff, Honorable Marquesi, and Honorable Sibia in that order. Honorable Malani, so you may go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, one must indicate that uh, on some other issues you have covered me. Uh, let me welcome the presentation as well in terms of uh, the highlights that we have been given and as well welcome the input by Saus. And I would like to as well wish the president uh, well in terms of uh, driving the agenda of uh, students. And I want to ex actually express my feeling about how they consistently raise their issues and taking in consideration that they don't just say these are the issues of our student, but they always give recommendations. And I would want to say, Chair, with regards to what they have raised on their presentation, Perhaps we need to have a joint meeting as well with uh, NESFAS uh, and USAF so that we can deal with issues that has been raised by them regarding the funding. And Chairperson, uh, with regards to the presentation, I think one must indicate that uh, at this time in this particular space, we still have challenge in terms of ensuring that we are mainstreaming people with disability. And it is a grave concern on the basis that uh, I have went through the, the, the presentation and I, I could see that uh, on their presentations, issues of disability, people 
disabled people, they are not being considered like the, as they are able to break down all issues of women. So they just need to improve on that. And today, as I was going through the presentation as well, just to um, revise my thinking, I just contacted one of the commissioners of CGE in terms of what is the specific in terms of the quota for people with disability. I, uh, she indicated that it's 7% 7, 7 of quota. So I, I just want to say to the department, they just need to refine in terms of the specific target for people with disability. Because if we cannot speak transformation issue and access issue without including them in our plans and, and space. Uh, the other one chair, it's with regards to uh, what are the key changes has the post-graduating funding policy brought about the existing NRF postgraduate funding mechanism? For example, will the NRF still provide grant holder linked postgraduate scholarship? And lastly, Chair, the other one is with regards to what factors or challenges have been experienced that may affect or alter how the new funding model is implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mananisto. Honorable Bosso. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. And um, I might just add my congratulations to you. You have uh, acted as chairperson for a number of meetings, but I believe you were elected today as the permanent uh, chairperson. As I also read in the newspaper that the ANC uh, designated you for that um, position. And I would uh, like to congratulate you on, on that, uh, even as I also want to uh, add my name to the others. We have congratulated the uh, new president of uh, South African uh, Union of Students. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough job lying, lying ahead, and I, I um, want to convey all my best wishes to both of you. Um, regarding the, um, yes. Um, your network is a little bit uh, unstable. Perhaps you can consider switching off the camera. Uh, yes. Okay, does this sound better? Thank you. At least, uh, Honorable Let's see, you could have seen. I uh, could have seen that I, I have a jacket on and everything, so that uh, to put his mind at ease, he's always concerned about my well-being, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, now, uh, regarding the, the presentation of the NRF, uh, while I also want to add my concern to the whole problem of so many fewer students being funded for uh, postgraduate study, as there are very, uh, well, very few courses, uh, undergraduate courses, which prepares the student for the um, for the job market as it is. It needs to be followed up with a professional diploma or a professional postgraduate certificate or whatever. And, and uh, it may be a little bit of a waste of money if we only, uh, uh, you know, assist a percentage of those who um, were awarded the undergraduate degrees. Um, to proceed to the postgraduate. What I also noticed with concern is the lot of lease money that is available to the National Research uh, Foundation. And in fact, I would like to, to make a link between that and the very strict quotas in terms of race, which is indicated. Now, the problem with the whole race quota is a thing that has been discussed many times uh, already. But if I may just take you yourself, chairperson, as a uh, as an example, maybe in 25 years' time or 30 years' time, you might have a child um, going for postgraduate study. Then you might may have been a minister for quite a few years, and one could say that this child of yours has had every opportunity that any um, one could uh, could covet. It would be possible, you know, access to uh, good educational institutions and everything. But then this person is still um, uh, prejudiced in a uh, you know in a positive way towards being one of the eighty percent. While uh, disregarding 
what the background and the economic circumstances of a white or a, uh, yeah, even a, a colored or an Indian student is, they are part of the 20% um, or uh, uh, regarding whites only the 10%. So uh, you have to be very good to be part of the uh, small number that can be accommodated. And the problem with that is not to say only that uh, this is discrimination against uh, a certain group because it's very really easy to respond to that and to say, well, it's about time that you are discriminated against as you were discriminated for for so long. The problem uh, lies in the um, human reality that if your um, position does not depend on your performance, but on your identity, then one tends not to do your best because your position is, in a sense, uh, guaranteed as a start. And while I understand the, um, that, that the government departments, including this one and also the National Research Foundation, wants to transform the whole society, uh, it may end into, well, not even end, it uh, evolves into a position where we need to import engineers, for example, from Cuba, because we don't have uh, enough anymore. So we start by saying we want to transform this, this uh, society uh, to be representing of the demographics as a well. whole. And then at another stage, one needs uh, skills, which has to be uh, brought in from abroad. Uh, because you don't have it at your own place, because you decided that some of the some segments uh, should not be funded, uh, regardless of their own financial position or background or anything else. And I link that um, this incentive to perform to the fact that there is less and less money, even before the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, economic um, implosion that that uh, brought to us. Uh, then I want to add, while you asked the question about what informed the um, age restriction, I also want to refer to that because I think that it is really uh, something which uh, happens often, that somebody uh, studies, do a first degree, even maybe a, a professional diploma, then enters the workforce, and then maybe at the age of 40 or 45 or 50, with a lot of uh, practical experience, um, you know, develops in oneself this, uh, this need or this, uh, what's uh, not a need in a, in a physical sense, but you really want to contribute uh, to the academia and to also add value to your own uh, training in that sense. And uh, an older person can, in, a, in quite another way, really contribute in a, uh, you know, uh, in a way which somebody which has only studied till that stage might not be able to. Not that I want to say the one is better than the other, but it is complementary. And it would uh, really, I think, uh, add value to the whole um, post-school education and training sector if all the people who develop this uh, urge to further their studies can, uh, could also be uh, funded without any um, discrimination on the grounds of age. That is all I had to say. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Boshoff. Um, Honorable Makesi. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on your uh, appointment as the chair of uh, the committee, and also congratulations to the president of uh, the South African Union of uh, Students. Um, I think we are all uh, looking forward to working with you, and uh, hopefully we'll have um, a more fruitful uh, relationship going forward. Um, I just want to, uh, I've got a couple of questions that I would like to ask. Um, my questions are specifically on the NRF um, because I'm trying to basically understand uh, their funding model, um, their policy on, uh, on funding. Um, specifically, I actually uh, wanted to find out, you know, the difference. I think you have also mentioned that the difference of um, why they decide on fully funding certain students and 
why they decide that then the other students will be partially funded. Um, why do they uh, specifically, my question is like, why do they have that, uh, that benchmark? Because already students, uh, universities themselves, they have a benchmark on which students uh, are eligible to study an honors degree or a master's degree and a PhD degree. So universities themselves, you know, they understand if a student is an average, I think during my time, if you had an average of about 60% uh, across uh, on your, your junior degree, then you qualify to do your, your honors degree. And I think that also goes on with your master's and, and your honors degree. Uh, with your with your uh, your PhD, so why is it that um, uh, uh, NRF uh, believes that they also have to put uh, another you know benchmark? And also, I think we have to be uh, aware of you know our realities on the ground. Uh, you must remember, you know, if you are seeing more students, um, especially African students, who are not able to you know, to proceed or also, you know, to who are unable to, to achieve more than 60%. Um, you must remember that, like, you know, they come from backgrounds that are very challenged. Uh, first of all, you know, the language, um, uh, their language uh, impediments uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when they, when they go to school and, you know, uh, already our academic institutions, they require them to be able to, to study and learn uh, everything um, in, uh, in English, which is uh, basically a foreign language to them, uh, which is language that they're not using in the, is, is not their mother tongue. So that in, in on its own is an impediment for them, making them not be able to achieve, you know, the, the kind of uh, grades that you as NRF, an NRF expects them to do that, to, to, to achieve. So it looks like, you know, you are not aware of you know the realities, like you know, of 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 of, of those challenges, and also um, the other issue that I also have is that um, you know uh, I think uh, Honorable Boshoff has covered me. Um, I don't understand why do you have to have specifically when it comes to honors, masters, and 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 PhD uh, students to say that you know you have to uh, focus on on race. Um, uh, the reason being, uh, I don't think uh, uh, there's that much, um, there'll be that much uh, disparity, like, because at the end of the day, we are working with, uh, now you have a, an issue whereby you have 60% students that are black, so obviously you won't be funding them. Uh, and then you have, you know, 75 students uh, who, are, uh, who are white, who are obtaining, you know, um, above 75%. Uh, so basically, you're not going to be funding anyone at the end of the day. So you won't be able to achieve your objectives because um, you have already your policies have, has, uh, is restricting on, on both levels. Um, so I just want to find out, you know, uh, specifically to say, why do you feel like uh, you as an institution you have to your your funding precedes what uh, the university has already done because if if they have their own benchmark, that should actually for you should make you you know to be more comfortable to say that we are going to fully fund everybody that gets uh, that is um, eligible to do an honors or a PhD or a master's degree. So I just want to find out, and also, you know, when you say that, uh, when we are saying that, you know, like, okay, we are going to fund uh, black students, I can understand um, the NSFAS to say that, okay, fine, um, because NSFAS doesn't doesn't fund based on race; it funds based on affordability. So I don't know why do you feel like, you know, as NRF, you have to, especially in an academic uh, environment, that you feel like. You, you need to be able now to go on and separate and say like, you know, based on race, uh, we, we, we are gonna find uh, black students over, you know, the other races. Uh, so I, I, I would like you maybe to just uh, uh, make me understand that. I mean, I know very well of uh, the inequalities. I can understand if you're talking about, you know, um, uh, your undergraduate um, uh, studies. That's where we've seen uh, the inequalities and exclusion of black students, specifically, like I think during my time, specifically, you know, it used to be a problem in the, uh, the science and the medical faculties, whereby you'll find that, that like there, there's uh, this kind of, um, you know, disparity, or maybe like, you know, students feel like, you know, they've been excluded because they're of race. But I don't know if that is also applicable when it comes to honors and master's degree. And also, we also have to understand that, um, 
as you have rightfully said, is that uh, many of the students that obtain their PhD degrees, they end up uh, uh, being employed. So now if we are excluding some students uh, based on race, uh, that means like, you know, we are basically uh, increasing our number of students, uh, of, of, of South Africans that are unemployed. We are actually um, going against, you know, their economic growth, which is one of your, your, your goals. So I just would like you to understand, uh, basically understand, um, you know, how does that work? Um, and also the issue of age limit. So obviously a student that comes in and, and completes their, their, their junior degree, and then they have, you have this policy of yours of saying that we are not gonna fund you fully. Um, that uh, forces that particular uh, graduate to say, okay, fine, I don't have money to, to pay uh, for my studies, so therefore I have to go find work. And that can actually be the, a delaying, uh, another delaying way for them to be able to, to say that, you know, what they initially wanted was to, uh, to have a PhD degree. But now with your impediment, with your policies that says, because they didn't receive, um, they didn't, um, obtain 60% and above, uh, that means like, you know, uh, or 75%, that means that you know, they cannot uh, do their, 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 their uh, honors or master's degree. So I, I just want to say that like, you know, it looks like your policies, they really go against your own objectives uh, of uh, ensuring that like, you know, uh, first of all, you have, you know, you said like you, uh, your goal was to have, I think uh, it was about 50%, uh, uh, I don't remember anyway, the, a percentage, but now you are half. You are basically at this stage. You are you. You've just obtained half of the goals that you, you your objectives that you, you intended to. So um, I think you have to really look at your your policies because, like, somehow for me, it looks like they basically you your policies uh, works against your objectives. Um, so uh, as I'm saying that the issue of age limit, and that means like, you know, now the student, when they come back and you know what happens, you know, once you leave your academic um, environment, you end up being involved in relationships, you get married, you have kids and life takes its course. And then maybe when you reach the age of, you know, 35 or 40, you say, you know what, my, my dream or whatever was to really uh, to, to do my, my PhD and now I want to go back and now again, I'm excluded because of my age. So um, I think those are things that, you know, maybe uh, we should really look, at, look into. And the other issue that uh, I have, um, I think that is uh, uh, something that I would like to raise with you, uh, Chairperson, is the fact that I think when we have these kind of discussions, um, I, it will be, I think, for me, it's desirable that like uh, either the minister or the deputy minister do attend these meetings because for me, it becomes just a talk shop if you don't have any uh, political intervention um, whereby decisions have to be made. And also, you know, issues that are raised uh, within the committee can actually be really taken seriously because I don't know what is another form of uh, ensuring that like, if there is another one of ensuring that what is raised within uh, the committee itself, it gets to, to the minister's um, as office so that he can be able to address. But I think, um, I don't know if it's possible going forward that like, because I mean, we have a minister and we also have a deputy minister. So I think uh, it, it has to be like, you know, a, 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 uh, a, what to put a, it has to be like uh, something that we, we ensure that it happens um, uh, regularly when we're having these committees that uh, one of them has to be in these meetings because otherwise they become just um, uh, fruitless and with no uh, commitment, political commitment, because I believe without any political commitment, we won't be able to, to be able to achieve anything. Otherwise we're just uh, having discussions amongst ourselves and with no solutions. Uh, from from these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Marquesi. Honorable Sibia. Um, thanks, Chaperson. Uh, thanks for the <laughs> Sipogazi, can you mute yourself, please? Thanks for all the presentations. And congratulations to our new chairperson of our portfolio committee, as well as uh, congratulations to the officials of SAUS. And we would like also to welcome our new member to our committee, by uh, Honorable Masati. 
Um, some questions are, are covered, but uh, in uh, under Asraus, I don't know the department how is going to address the issue of non-funding streams cater for postgraduate qualifications. And the other one, I don't know because the ministers are not with us because uh, mm, in their recommendations, students debt, student debts for postgraduates must be cleared. I think that the minister is supposed to give us a, a clear direction how to clear this these steps for the students. Thanks, Chaperson. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Sibia. Honorable King. Good morning, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, would you mind me keeping my camera off? I'm really struggling with some um, network challenges, please. Um, Chairperson, let me also take the opportunity to welcome you as the new Chairperson. Um, it is very welcoming to see a young person um, taking a position that you are, have taken on. Um, from the Democratic Alliance side, we will give you all the support um, and we will gladly work with you going forward in reaching um, agreements um, to ensure that higher education um, reaches its goal in ensuring that we've got graduates who can find employment. And also congratulations to the new uh, president of Sawusa as well. Um, Chairperson, my first question would be, um, when the NRF presented itself some time ago on its APP, it actually stated that they received funding um, of 20% from the parliamentary grant. The DSI contract funding was 72%. Uh, they received other income of 5% and sundry income of 3% to make up uh, the funding that they have. It was also mentioned today that there was conversations had with National Treasury to ensure that we have uh, funding for students that we cannot necessarily give funding to, to uh, complete their research. So I would just like to firstly find out um, regarding the conversation that was had with National Treasury, what was the outcome of that conversation? Um, and was a commitment made to, to give them extra funding uh, for these students to complete their studies um, in the doctoral um, degrees. Then also, also in the IPP, it was mentioned that the transition to, towards implementing the DSI NRF postgraduate student funding policy will result in a decrease in the number of students funded as we move towards full cost of study. The NRF or the DSI will continue to explore opportunities to fund those applications considered favorable. So when you read this chairperson, my concern would be what other factors and challenges have the NRF experience that may affect how the new funding model is implemented um, because now we can see there is a shortfall in how we fund students. Um, also chairperson, when we look at the NRF, what key uh, changes has the new postgraduate funding policy brought about to the existing NRF postgraduate funding mechanisms? Um, just for us to get an example, if an existing um, NRF uh, funded student can also then hold uh, a bursary or a funding from another institution. Um, so that's all from my side. Oh, and the last thing I was covered on um, Honorable Machesi and Honorable Boshoff when it comes to the race allocation um, and how we would rather consider moving into an, a model where we can say we will work on a proxy of disadvantage instead of a proxy of race. Um, in order to avoid the discrimination and exclusion of a whole lot of students that might take place. Um, and then the last thing, just a, a, a general question when I heard Sawusa, I just wanted to know from NRF, realistically speaking, will they be able to fund um, postgraduate students and how will this have a bearing on the sustainability of the NRF 
um, financially with regards to funding if they were to include them as well. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable King. Um, before I um, allow for the next Honorable Member to make her inputs, perhaps I um, should uh, do the correct thing by introducing officially um, Honorable uh, Dibulelo Mashati, who has moved from agriculture to um, higher education, science and innovation um, on, the, on the benches of the African National Congress. Um, she will be uh, taking over from my seat uh, or my duties as the whip. So she's the new whip um, of the African National Congress to the Portfolio Committee on Higher Education, Science and Innovation. Welcome to you, Honorable Mashati. I think many members across uh, the, the, the various political parties that sit in this committee are already may already know you from, from the many um, deliberations and contributions you've made in the House. And we're really excited. Um, Honorable Mashati is not youth, but she is young. Um, as, as youth, uh, you know, we always say that there's the old youth. So uh, she is a young woman. She's not reached 40 yet. Um, she's far from 40, in fact. Um, and um, and I think we're really excited to 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 have the kind of vibrancy that she'll be bringing into the committee. I mean, even considering the fact that she she comes from a um, the, the national leadership of the Young Communist League, you know, she may be able to assist us with understanding the triple oppressions of race, class, and gender as they've come up thoroughly in the engagements we've had this morning, and you know, also assist us in in understanding you know dialectic materialism and various. Uh, you know, uh, um, analysis around that in terms of ensuring that um, we, we, we find equity. I think the conversations that are coming up now, uh, Honorable Mashati, are issues around equity and us trying to understand the importance for us to, to, to really be intentional and robust and unapologetic about ensuring that we have equity in society. And equity and equality are two different things. And I think um, that is what you know, when you look at what uh, we're trying to achieve here with the um, with the, um, the 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 new postgraduate funding model, I really think it's very unapologetic on issues around um, creating equity within science and innovation, and generally within um, research and development um, across the spectrum, and 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 then doing the injustices of the past. Um, but I'll allow, uh, so having said that, I just wanted to really affirm the fact that we are really honored and excited to have Honorable Mashati in our committee. Honorable Mashati, um, you can make your, your inputs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And um, I, I, I duly request to keep my video off due to connectivity in the three state. And uh, first and foremost, congratulations to you as the newly elected chairperson of the portfolio committee. Um, I, I think from the benches of the African National Congress, we, we, we do, we, we are firm young people, we are firm women as leaders and we, your appointment is a clear indication that we're serious about emancipation of women through political leadership as well. And um, I, I really wish to, to thank uh, you in your introductory, uh, remarks in introducing me to, to the committee. I'm really looking forward to working in this committee. I've seen in the committee, there's Dr. Lotret, whom I've served with in section 25, as well as in uh, Dr. Tam, who's also alternating there from time to time. So I hope uh, in this new committee, I will be able to work with them as good as we were working in that particular committee. However, Chairperson, let me welcome the presentations made today. But two critical issues um, are relating to NRF. One, I think uh, honorable members have raised numerous questions relating to what I wanted to speak to, so I won't repeat. But I want to check from NRF in relation to financial limitations. Given that they have already made a um, request to the National Treasury, had they been able to engage the department further over and above speaking to Treasury in relation to our financial uh, limitations in funding students and what has been the department's response in that regard. Number two, on there's a slide as I'm sure is slide 17 where would they are speaking about um, um, indicating 
which sector they will, which which uh, which sector they will be funding. But when they speak about uh, people with disability, the framework has moved from four percent to one percent. What informs this particular decline? And if there is a decline in terms of people with living with disability not willing to study, what has NRF done? to attract that particular sector in ensuring that we deal with these inequalities that we speak to, because um, people with disability continue to have serious challenges. Thirdly, Chair, and when you speak to even the issue of age, who has been funded, you, you would want to, as, an advocate, as we advocate for people with disability, the general expectation would be that people with disability will be funded over and above the age of 35, given their own general limitations in society. How does the new framework um, take cognizance of that particular fact? Lastly, Chair, is in relation to, because I, I see all here on the presentation, there's no indication in terms of dropouts, whether NRF has had challenges in as far as people dropping off uh, these qualifications and what then becomes, um, what follows the, the process and what, what also informs these particular dropouts, mainly in as far as women are concerned. And last, uh, the very, very last one, Chair, is around the, the average in as far as completion of uh, the qualifications. When you look at the average that have been presented before us, you can see it's 40%, 30%. What informs this particular average, especially when it comes to record time? What, and what has been the, what is NRF's approach to ensure that we begin to, to escalate and expand on ensuring that more people finish within record time? Of course, we would understand that most, most probably when you do your postgraduate, you are already having families, children, and so on and so on. There are other variables that can lead to you not. That was the case. We would have we would see more people coming through precisely because others would have finished on a record time and being able to not to 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 really um drag the funny the finances of the the institution so what is it that they mean what is it that they're encouraging or what is it that nrf will be doing to ensure that uh, the, the 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 completion of studies is done with the record time so that we are having we could actually see more young people coming through because when you look at the presentation between the age of 21 up until 25 i think that's where you see much more exit um uh, more uh, progress in as far as a uh, completion of of qualifications that clearly indicates to you that particular cohort of young people would be able to go to as far as phds and be able to finish within record time if we could actually make sure that as we move along we move along with them thank you very much chair thank you very much uh Honorable um, Masati. Uh, Honorable Makesi, is that a follow up question? Or did you forget uh, something? Leave something out? Yes, I, I've got something out. Um, uh, can, can I go ahead? Yes, you may. Okay, I, I just wanted to find out, you know, because um, and another I've mentioned that you know, they will be approaching um, SARS regarding uh, information of students that will be, um, that have found work and, you know, who are currently employed when they graduate from universities. So I just want to find out because like there's a POPI um, you know, Act uh, that uh, prevents uh, sharing of information. Um, so I, do, I don't know, like, you know, uh, the kind of information that we get, because obviously I think I would assume that uh, the information that we'll be looking for from SARS would be, you know, are you as this particular student employed? Uh, who are they employed with? And you know, what kind of job are they? You know, um, have they uh, they filled or whatever? Um, but now I just want to find out, like, you know, uh, will the Poppy Act uh, prevent them from uh, from obtaining that kind of information? Because 
um, I, I think at the moment, like there's kind of restrictions of, uh, you know, getting personal information and making it public uh, uh, to, 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 to everybody. So um, I just want to find out if, you know, it's something that you have considered and, um, and in case that, uh, you know, uh, the Poppy Act will prevent you from doing that, what other ways I want to make sure that this kind of information does come through. Um, the other thing that I wanted to find out, you know, um, I've got interest always on on STEM. Um, I, I I don't I don't recall seeing any uh, information of um, you know STEM students like you know like who go into um, um, honors and 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 masters and and PhD like you know. Um, if you have any comparison with other, you know, uh, degrees in terms of like, you know, who are you finding the most? Do you also have, um, do you prioritize? Because I, I still think that like, you know, the STEM students, you know, uh, if the more we have, the more we encourage our students to, to go into STEM, the more we have uh, a chance of, uh, you know, having more science and innovation and also economic um uh, yeah, influence from specifically, like you know, when it comes to uh, innovation that comes from universities, especially specifically from the STEM uh, 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 students. Not that I'm undermining other students, uh, other other faculties, but all I just want to find out is like, is there a way that we are trying to try to promote more STEM? And do you actually say, okay, let's look at which. Um, uh, faculties are more likely to produce uh, economic um, uh, uh, improvement uh, as compared to other faculties. And I, I don't know if STEM does, uh, and if it does, uh, do you have more of uh, initiatives to ensure that, like you know, more students, specifically from um, you know from um, basic education, uh, to encourage uh, the students there or learners there to to actually take STEM as, as their main subjects, because there's a lot of reluctance from what I could recall of students taking those subjects. But is there any way that you are making sure that you encourage them to, to do that? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the second opportunity. Thank you, Honorable Marquesi. Um, DG, there's a, a lot of uh, remarks that have come from members. And I think it just is an indication of the fact that there's interest with regards to ensuring that uh, you know a majority of South Africans have access to 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 this postgraduate funding, um, perhaps just you know, I, I think we must commend the department and the NRF, um, you know, noting that the, the 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 new postgraduate funding policy is underpinned by the principles of equity, of opportunity, represent, representativity, prioritization, and enhanced access, success, and throughput, and you know, considering race, age, gender, disability, and nationality. And I think what's even more progressive is the fact that, um, you know, um, financial uh, need and whether or not a student is financially deserving is being factored in. And I think that's the kind of progress we want to see. But I think we can, we are not at a point in South Africa where we can shy away from the triple oppressions of, you know, particular classes or particular collectors in our society. And I think we need to continue to be very intentional about the type of, um, you know, uh, um, transformation and we want to see in order for us to achieve a, a South Africa that, you know, um, is enshrined in equity. Um, so I, 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 you know, from, from my perspective, we 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 think that um, the the funding policy of the of the of the department or the postgraduate funding policy of the department in terms of its intentions of the transformation framework uh, is very intentional and is very progressive. Up until we reach a stage where you know we can have an alternative conversation, um, and 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 we want to support the mainstreaming of of demographic um, representation. So I, I don't know, DG, but um, let's hear from yourselves as the department and the NRF on what your views are. But I, I, I don't know, and Honorable Mananisa, you may assist us, but I think what uh, reflects in this transformation framework and the postgraduate funding policy is exactly what we advocate for on a daily basis in this portfolio committee. But um, um, yeah, DG, um, you know, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Honorable Chair and also uh, to the honorable members. 
I will not address all of the questions. I'll uh, request the chair and the CEO of the NRF to pick up on some of the questions. I do, however, want to uh, comment on some of the questions that are at the interface of the implementation of the policy, as well as uh, the broader set of challenges uh, of the country as a policy department that has to uh, work closely with the NRF and yourselves. And the first one is that the point made by Honorable Makesi around transmitting this information and some of this discussion to the minister, we are giving her the assurance that uh, as a director general and the accounting officer, we will share the outcomes of this discussion with her. And if the portfolio committee would like perhaps to summarize those issues at the political uh, interface that require um, his intervention, uh, there could be a follow-up meeting. Uh, one of the issues, my second point that have been raised uh, relates to the question of uh, the in engagement between the department and national treasury and the NRF. Um, as the members would know, in the current budget cycle, um, the NRF and ourselves have been informed by National Treasury that there are no new sources of funding. And if we want to um, fund anything new or more than what we're funding, we need to um, reprioritize within the funding envelope that the department has been given. Uh, so uh, there is no new money and uh, the changes uh, that are being discussed and proposed today are unlikely to happen at least in the next financial year. However, what uh, we've agreed between ourselves and National Treasury is that the Minister of uh, Finance and the Minister of Science and Innovation, Higher Education Science and Innovation will have a bilateral uh, to discuss and find a different avenue on how to make postgraduate funding uh, in South Africa is approached differently in the sense of seeing this funding as an investment rather than as an expense. So uh, in the bilateral we had with the DHET National Treasury last week, there was an agreement that the two ministers would meet uh, to look at that. And third point is that as uh, the uh, honorable members would know, there is a ministerial task team that is looking at um, the totality of the funding that government needs to fully uh, understand and appreciate for both undergraduate and postgraduate um, funding. This is led by our colleagues from higher education and training. So once that modeling has been completed, um, I'm almost certain that the committee will have, if you like, a view uh, of the totality of the funding that we need based on the demand uh, from the students. So that's the package of response that I would like to say uh, we would like perhaps to share with the minister, uh, bring the update to the portfolio committee on the basis of those investment, uh, those discussions at an appropriate time. Number three, um, the proposal from the honorable chair around the centralization of funding under one institution. We think that uh, it's, a, it's a good suggestion. We will be using the interministerial committee on science and innovation that uh, uh, cabinet agreed should meet to propose this idea and to sit the discussion around uh, how this could work perhaps uh, agree on a principle and then be given the space and the opportunity to then come back uh, either to cabinet and, and yourself on what are its implications and what is the value add that I think uh, uh, the country would have if this was done. So that's uh, number three. Uh, and then number four, um, Chair, you did indicate uh, the issue in your first intervention around the ministerial guidelines, which um, I think Romila correctly say they were 213, 214 and the transformation framework. These are slightly different things. 
The guidelines uh, that we are talking about today were specifically to address the demographics um, and the equity or trying to achieve equity within the funding for the postgraduate students. The transformation framework that we are developing goes beyond that. Uh, for an example, how do we ensure that the beneficiaries of research that gets funded by government um, ensure that, or the beneficiaries go beyond just, if you like, the traditional, maybe the private sector, but how do we make sure that if the uh, cooperatives that can benefit from the research that we do, small, medium enterprises, what is the mechanism in which you can make IP that is developed from these publicly funded institutions can have access to such a IP. So the, the framework that we are developing and we have agreed that we'll be sharing with you, I think late in October, uh, it's, a, it's a more than encompassing, uh, whereas the ministerial guidelines were just a subset, if I can use that mathematical uh, analogy um, around that. But as we say, we will be coming to the committee uh, on that. We are having a conversation with the entities around how the framework uh, could encompass what I think we have already been doing, which was a secondary part of the question uh, on this ministerial guidelines with the broader um, issue. And then I would ask the NRF perhaps to go into the main set of issues around what was the rationale for these percentages and this breakdown? Because I, I think there is a logic in uh, the choice of these percentages, whether it's women, whether it's people with disabilities, 4%, uh, whether it's uh, black, white, and, uh, and, and Indian. Uh, and, and I can say it, but I, I would like the NRF perhaps to, to, to talk about that because um, as Honorable um, uh, Makesi has said, there is the rationale uh, as to how this can be done. And then Honorable Spear around the issue of uh, student debt to be cleared. I think this is another matter that I think requires a political intervention through the ministry. And again, we'll take that up. So with those uh, set of issues that are at the level of policy by the department, we've taken note of these issues and some of them we don't have answers to today, uh, such as you know, how does government uh, deal with the issue of funding, how do you centralize funding, uh, there will be a work in progress. So may I then hand over, uh, I'm not so sure whether the chair or the CEO of the NRF will be responding to, uh, to the rest of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DG. Um, if I just come in here, and thank you, DG, for answering or responding to a number of the issues uh, that came up. Uh, maybe as a way of starting, let me again extend my congratulations to the leadership of SAUS, uh, with whom we, we have been working, um, under the leadership of uh, the Minister, uh, Honorable Nzimande. We, we have had uh, joint uh, discussions with SAUS, um, together with NESFAS and the DHET on some of the issues that were raised, and we do recognize the fact that these are serious issues that need to be addressed, and we remain committed in addressing uh, some of these issues. But indeed, uh, we're very much aware of the gaps that, that you have raised uh, from, from South's point of view, and our conversations will continue in that regard. Just to jump to the issues that came in the questions, um, and I will uh, defer some of these to my colleagues here, but there are a few that I think are worth mentioning uh, before I, I ask them to respond. I think the, the, the bigger issue, honorable members and honorable chair here, is around the limitation on the funding side. I think that is the biggest aspect that we have. We do not have enough resources to take us where we really want to be or where we need to be. If we did not have this limitation, probably a number of the issues that we raise, we're not even going to come up. Uh, issues of, for instance, um, the limitations uh, from the age point of view. Uh, on one element, if you look at some of the studies that I think Romila uh, went at length of uh, describing, 
we, we have done this study where we say, if you look at the bulk of the graduates, at what age are they in? Um, and you'll see a number of them falling within the, the lower end between the 21 to the 25 uh, age uh, gap. And they're saying, even within those ones alone who are young, who have a very long life, uh, or rather long uh, working life before reaching retirement, we can't even find all of those. But at the very same time, we then find ourselves with challenges where, for instance, uh, not so long ago, I was dealing with a case of a 60 year old uh, who wanted uh, uh, funding for a PhD. And on the basis of limits, if one were to sort of assess and say, what do we really actually make an investment, which, was, which is going to make sense for South Africa? Do I invest in a 60 year old who, by the time they finish their PhD, they're 65? Or you go to a younger person who wants to do a PhD who's 22 or who's 25? who actually might actually have much more uh, to, uh, to offer. So I think it's an issue of prioritization that needs to be taken into consideration. But this issue of prioritization is actually coming up largely because we don't have enough funding to cover all the issues. Um, if I just jump into a few issues before I ask uh, my colleagues to, to respond, there's an issue that was raised uh, by two honorable members uh, on the disability, uh, Honorable Matlasi and Honorable Koza touch on this aspect. Um, again, our approach here is data driven. We, we had the target of 5% for a while, but when we looked into the number of applicants who will qualify under the disability category, we have not really gotten to get to even 1% of uh, those people. And it then made more sense that Maybe they are there, but they're not actually coming into the system. And that could be a question which I had uh, this discussion with the colleagues in the NRA, where we're saying, why aren't these people coming in? But you'll understand as well, honorable members, that when we do this work with the universities that will have the disability, uh, disability units and so on, and we will then expect those who qualify to still apply and to be encouraged from their universities. When we look into the numbers, we, we had the target of 5%, but we've never really crossed in the 1% gap. And this is the reason why we then felt that as opposed to actually having that target at 5%, one can still even drop it to a, to a lower percentage, but it is data-driven for now. If I then just jump to quite a few uh, issues here, one of the issues that maybe is also worth uh, responding to now um, is the issue on the, uh, I just want to pick a few before I jump into this. So maybe maybe let me start with the issue that relates to the chairs that Honorable Mukaja raised. Um, in terms of the uh, the ratio of achievers versus the financial needy students, this aspect I will ask uh, Deputy CEO uh, Dr. Pillay to to respond to this aspect uh, when he gives his remarks. But I think it's a good point that you've raised and we really um, take that as, as something that I think we need to look into uh, in more details. There could be a few things that in my view, we might not have answers readily available now and we're willing to actually submit 10 responses to some of those questions. Um, for instance, the same issues around the studies about what is the most expensive course that one can do. We have that information and I think this is something that then also guides uh, the packages or the, the, the bulk uh, pack figures around some of the bazaars then say, how much do you actually offer at honest level? But Dr. Pillay will also touch on this aspect. Um, there's a bigger issue that I think is also very much uh, important to, to reflect on quickly. One of the issues here is the issue that was raised by uh, Honorable Matlasi about the dropouts and the dropout rates and what we are, we are sort of doing to encourage the, uh, the people to, you know, to stay or to finish within the record time. Um, I will ask Dr. Pillay to deal with the aspect when he responds to um, a, a few other issues as well that, that I've asked him to, to look at. The issue on the STEM side, I think it's a critical aspect of Honorable Marquis. And I think the issue here is, of course, again, prioritization is a critical aspect where we need to look into which are the areas that can actually make more sense uh, given the limited resources. 
what do we prioritize, uh, what is the breakdown. We do have that information in terms of who are we funding, who falls within the STEM kind of sciences and so on. We don't have it now on the slides, but we can actually make it available uh, for the honorable members to, to, to engage further on. Um, the benchmark in terms of the full course of study versus the partial course of study, again, this is something that Dr. Pillay will, uh, together with, with uh, Dr. Maharaj, will respond to uh, in, a, in a short while. Um, there was a question that was raised by Honorable Cosa around the grant uh, holder linked uh, bazaar funding as well. Um, it will be responded to uh, by Dr. Romila Maharaj and Dr. Pillay uh, shortly. There's one item that the DG responded to, but I thought maybe we might actually update is noting the fact that uh, next month in October, we will come and discuss the transformation framework uh, in detail. But I would like maybe uh, Dr. Petio to just touch it. Um, I was muted, apologies. Um, Dr. Petro Matutu, just give a sense on where we are in terms of the transformation framework, uh, just adding to what the DG has covered in terms of the differentiation between, between this framework and, and uh, how the other targets will arrive at. So with these colleagues, uh, I think for now, I will just ask the, uh, Dr. Matutu to respond quickly to the transformation aspect, and I will then hand over to Dr. Pillay, who will then respond to the specific questions, including with the question on, on the slides, um, about slide 22, about the recent data. I note, uh, Honorable Chair, that the data that we have um, ends uh, in 2015. Uh, at the moment, we are busy collating new data, which is going to inform again our decisions going forward. Uh, we will respond to this uh, in a short while as well. Slide number 23, where the raised questions are very critical um, in terms of changing the profile um, on the 75 and above, or to get to get the you know uh, uh, the the black uh, people or students who are funded to then be on the on the uh, you know um, increase from from where it is now. Uh, we're going to just share a little bit of information there when Dr. Pillay responds in terms of uh, what we have done. Um, and for now, maybe let me just hand over to Dr. Madhu to respond to those questions. Uh, you know, to, 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 to the first question I asked, and then Dr. Pillay will then come in. So, Dr. Madhu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, the chair, and congratulations on the new position of chairing. Um, from my side, it's uh, um, the transformation framework of the NRF uh, that was approved by the NRF board in 2017, and um, that is a complete document from the NRF side. Perhaps what was being referred to is the transformation framework of the Department of Science and Innovation. So the NRF1 has got uh, the four components uh, where we focus on the transformation of the researcher component. And we're talking about transforming the researcher component. And that starts at a pipeline level from uh, the postdoc level, uh, sorry, the, the, the postgraduate level. So the postgraduate framework would be a component which is trying to implement this uh, transformation framework because we would like to transform the researcher uh, uh, cohort. Uh, we've just completed also the uh, leading uh, researchers and scholars uh, uh, program. And uh, that is also meant at transforming the researcher cohort, uh, looking at the top achievers within the researchers. So uh, that would be part of the researcher cohort. The research enterprise as well, the transformation of the research enterprise. We are busy with our research agenda, which is supposed to assist with that. And we're also busy with our uh, framework 
for a research impact, which is trying to transform our research enterprise. And then there's a component on the science and society, transforming our science and society. We busy also with the science uh, engaged research uh, uh, framework, which is supposed to assist with that. And then we're looking at a fully diverse and inclusive organization, which we call one NRF, uh, where we're looking at the transformation of the organization internally. We started with a, 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 a culture survey, which is supposed to assist us with that. Of course, we have our uh, equity targets there. All these elements of the transformation framework have been uh, ingrained within our vision 2030 and within our strategy 2025. So all these aspects are aspects which have been uh, uh, ingrained there. As a result, the intents there are looking at transformation through this lens of the transformation framework, although it was approved in 2017 and our strategies were approved in 2019. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Patiwa. Chair, with your permission, uh, I will respond to the questions as uh, requested by the CEO. Uh, the first one of business, of course, is to congratulate you on your new position, and I hope you uh, leave a legacy behind uh, during your tenure. Also, like to congratulate the leadership of SARS and uh, say hello and good morning to my fellow colleagues from the DSI, from the NRF, and of course, most importantly, to all honourable members of the PPC. While receiving the questions from uh, many members of the PPC. I felt reassured and comforted that our presentation was interrogated. And I really was reassured by the latitude and depth of questions. So while there have been interventions made by Honorable Makachwa as a chair, uh, Honorable Koza, Honorable Boshoff, Honorable Makesi, Honorable King, and Honorable Mashlatsi, I will respond to various items that you've referred to in the slide, but not necessarily directly to you as the honorable member of the PPC. What I want to say at the outset is that what you've seen presented today is the culmination of a number of years of deep thinking and hard work that was responsive to a particular situation in our country. And that was the ability to retain students within the pipeline of postgraduate training. And we found that the pipeline was a leaking pipeline with our interventions previously, largely because students were not able to afford to keep themselves uh, registered full-time as students and to complete their studies. And we reflected long and hard on this. We were also very cognizant of the fact that in taking this bold step, there would be some unintended consequences. For example, the number of students that you could fund but we were also brave enough to say, well, if that is a situation, let's hope that because of the, the, uh, the value of what we were doing, that additional resources could be found as we forge ahead. And therefore, today's presentation is largely saying to all of us, we have come up with a, with, with a strategy, we've come up with a policy that ad addresses equity and redress and transforms the postgraduate cohort, but there are challenges. And we had challenges in the implementation. We've dealt with them with fairly successfully, but what is very clear in the entire presentation is that we are only able to do so much because of limited resources. And resources would be a quick answer to all of this. If you look at the numbers, the numbers and the numbers are largely from students from designated groups, that is black and women students. If we had the resources, the postgraduate cohort would transform overnight if we had that, those resources. And that is why we took the unprecedented step of firstly, uh, of course, working very closely with the DG and informing the DG and the Department of Science and Innovation. And then of course, getting the board uh, of the NR, the chair of the board of the NRF to communicate 
uh, with the minister regarding our uh, dilemma. And then, of course, alerting National Treasury and uh, meeting with National Treasury to find out how best we can be assisted. So that is the crux of the problem. And I think if we can be able to resolve that, then that would be excellent. But I loved the suggestion by uh, Honorable Marchesi in the sense that, uh, you know, we can, we can go on talking here. It's more important as to what happens after this meeting and how do we escalate this to a point whereby it receives the attention that it deserves. So with those few uh, opening remarks, I want to uh, switch on to uh, Honorable Makrachra's questions, which I found very interesting. Um, I think your reference to the language we use is important. I like the one where you, where you want to differentiate between the word needy and deserving. And it's something that we at the NRF will carefully consider and, uh, and, and uh, reflect on in order to have a language that is more acceptable. I loved your suggestion about the centralization of funding and the DG has alluded to that. In fact, the centralization of funding orders called a science vote has come up in many previous reviews. And we think we have the view that if the funding can be placed from all, all departments into one R&D funding or RDNI funding, then it will go a long way towards us getting to that aspirational target of 1.5% of uh, R&D spend of GDP. For the last decade, we've been touching on 0.83%. There's white paper on science, technology, and innovation indicates 1%. And of course, if we really want to get to where we are, then we have to follow the examples of South Korea and Singapore, et cetera, where the spend is over 3%. So I think your idea, Chair, of centralizing funding is an excellent one, and I hope that it will find traction. And of course, it's also been referred to in the decadal plan as enunciated by the DG. The other observation you, that you made, Chair, which is very interesting and something that we will reflect on carefully as requested by you, is how to enhance academic performance. And I, your particular reference to quality versus quantity is important. And we think that you, know, you can have both, but it requires hard work. So it's something that we will reflect on, uh, as well as your reference to the term exceptional achievers. Now, one of the disclaimers I want to take is that what you see in front of you is not a thumbs up. All of those questions that you raise about age, uh, disabilities, uh, ratios, et cetera, have been carefully thought through and everything that you see in the presentation is evidence-led. So when you look at the young age that we are saying that you cannot be over age 35, it has been, it has been documented with evidence. It's been carefully thought through. It's been reflected. It's been shared with the stakeholder community, the higher education institutions, the science councils, the national facilities, our uh, partners uh, within the NSI, so that we have come to a situation whereby we want to deal with a particular challenge. And quite often we're guilty in a way sometimes when we do find something that we want to deal with, we often try to make it a one size fits all where we want to deal with different, uh, different other situations. And my, my experience has been, it's actually better if you sometimes tailor make a solution to deal with a particular challenge. The um, question of grant holder linked bursaries uh, was, uh, was uh, raised. And I think that's an important point, Honorable Causa, because one of the, th one of the uh, uh, interventions that actually uh, crippled us or, uh, or, or was a stumbling block in us achieving the targets, uh, our demographic targets, is often the grant holder bursaries were left in the hands of the researcher. And we had no control whatsoever about the demographic uh, distribution of the bursaries or the gender equity distribution of those bursaries. Therefore, the grant holder link bursaries will not continue to exist. There's only one policy, and that is the DSNR, DSI NRF postgraduate funding policy. And there's only a single point of entry. However, the question that was raised by universities as well is about, and raised yesterday as well, 
is about top-up funding. Can you take another bursary? The answer is top-up funding is allowed, but there are, very, there are very clear guidelines as to how these are implemented. The, so once again, whether you take the, uh, the holding of additional bursaries, uh, you know, we are saying that you can do that, but you can't do double dipping. You can't go and get a bursary from two departments within the government uh, and the same source, whereas we could actually spread that happiness uh, amongst many more students. The question of disabilities, I just want to reflect uh, just share briefly on it as well. We had over the last decade had 4% as our target. Over this decade, we've struggled to even reach 1%. But we have, we, we still have our eye on the radar. We still aspire towards getting to, it, to over the 1% mark. But one of the challenges that we found is that how disability is uh, described or established differs amongst different institutions. And maybe this, the, the conversation may be required about how would we as a system define disability? Uh, as far as the question about dropouts was raised, what I can categorically state is that over the last decade, uh, that I've been at the NRF, those students that are funded by the NRF have a higher and greater rate of success and throughput than students in general funded within the system. That is why you see the rates of completion are usually within three years for a PhD, yet the average within the system is five years. Now, there are exceptions, of course. There are students who, have, who are not able to complete the PhD in three years and require extension support. We have provided extension support to students uh, who are faced in, uh, with, with that. For example, with the onset of COVID-19, a number of masters and doctoral students were unable to complete their degrees within their two and three year uh, uh, periods respectively. The DSI has very kindly uh, repurposed funds and made available funds uh, to the value of 9 million, which we've disbursed to 75% of the students would apply so that they could complete their studies. Uh, regarding the, uh, regarding uh, the excellence um, uh, and transformation perspectives, we see excellence and transformation as two sides of the same coin. So we can transform the system and still maintain the excellence. The idea, uh, and, I, and I appreciate some of the sentiments expressed about making choices. The, the reality is as follows. Given the constrained fiscus that we have, we have to make some difficult choices. And the choices are, what do you stop doing? Uh, the issue of STEM was raised and uh, very, very uh, welcome as well. Uh, often we've been asked to put the A into STEM and to make it STEAM so that the arts are included. What will inform us going forward, uh, honorable chair, is that the decadal plan would also identify the knowledge domains that this country requires, the economic drivers uh, where we should invest in, so that we can then align our investments according to those guidelines or, and those, the, those that we've been identified. Uh, yes, I agree that uh, there is a need for political commitment. If this, if this uh, conversation ends here, it will really be unfortunate. It has to be escalated so that we, are a, we, we, we can go beyond you know, uh, the current funding. As the DG has rightly pointed out, the interaction with the National Treasury was quite simple. There are no new funds available. You will have to repurpose funds within or redirect funds within your current budget, but that's like moving the deck chairs, uh, just rearrangements of the deck chairs. Uh, I will stop there and I will invite Dr. Romila Maharaj and Dr. Mbulela in Congo to make any additional information available. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maharaj. Thank you. Um, I just add a, a few comments to what uh, other colleagues have already raised. Um, and the one relates to the 
the proportion of high achievers versus financially needy. So the way the implementation of this policy is designed is to determine whether or not uh, a student falls into that category of financially needy. We're following DHIT and NSFAS in terms of where we draw the line for financially needy. And any student that um, is financially needy will be eligible for full cost of study. And uh, students that are high achievers or that have a disability likewise will qualify for high co a full cost of study. But at this stage, we're not setting targets. And as the system evolves, we may at a later stage set targets. Our primary objective now is to make is to aim, is to fund financially needy students at full cost of study. Now, the point has been raised about why not fund all students at full cost of study. The bottom line is that we don't have the funds to do it. Already, we have had a, a great reduction in the number of students that we're funding. But I must point out that with the exception of the partial cost of study doctoral students, all other students are eligible for a greater value bursary than they would have gotten in the past. They are also able to top up that funding up to a maximum cost to, to fill in any shortfalls with respect to fees and accommodation and the living expenses. So that does exist. In addition, students are allowed to um, still continue to undertake um, some tutoring um, and demonstrating work, for example, up to 12 hours a week. And not only does that supplement their income as it does in other countries, but it also enables them to gain some experience by undertaking tutoring and demonstrating. Which takes me to the question of the most expensive course. In formulating the policy options, we did gather information from the universities with respect to the uh, fees, especially, and accommodation for different uh, institutions and different courses. And there is a vast range. I think perhaps the most expensive courses are uh, programs like the MBA programs, but the range is vast. And at the end of the day, we had to set some uh, guidelines in terms of caps, um, as does NSFAS and SFAP. I'd like to also comment on the dropouts. All NRF funded students enter into a, an agreement and sign a condition of grant, which requires them to complete their degree within one year of the end of the funding. And as um, Dr. Pillay has indicated, they also qualify for extension funding. So technically speaking, a master's student that qualifies for extension funding could get funding for three years, plus still have another year to complete. But we encourage students to complete their degree within the prescribed minimum period. And there was a question relating to the proportion of students that we fund in STEM. It has typically been between uh, 70 to 80 percent. If you look at slide 30 in the presentation from this morning, um, you it will give you the breakdown for this year. The, the questions that related to slide 23 and academic uh, requirements, um, from the applications that uh, we received uh, this year and the analysis that we did that we presented in slide 23, we are quite comfortable that there is a very large pool of black students that meet uh, these academic criteria. And this is evidenced by the large number of uh, South African black and female students that we were unable to fund, but that were eligible for funding uh, with these requirements. I'd also like to come back 
to the issue of the grant holder linked bursaries. Uh, firstly, uh, the grant holder linked bursaries uh, or students that receive grant holder linked bursaries did not go through any, necessarily go through any application process. And it was entirely up to uh, the grant holder. And for many years, we have been faced with the challenge of these grant holders claiming that they are unable to find black and female students. Yet we have a large pool of black and female students that meet the academic uh, criteria and we are unable to fund. So having a central application process allows us to see what is the pool of the students. It also enables us to have a transparent and an auditable process for determining financial need. A few years ago, the Auditor General challenged us because we did not require all honor students to apply directly to NRA for funding. They applied directly to their individual universities and the universities nominated students to the NRF. So we had to put into place an online application process where all honor students who want to be considered for NRF funding have to apply on the NRF online system and the individual universities then select the students that may be funded. So we've had this previously with the AG challenging us on not being able to present a pool of all the honors applicants. And with the new system, we can now provide that pool at the master's and doctoral level as well. Thank you. Maybe um, uh, through you, Chair, if you allow me. Um, before uh, uh, Dr. Maharaj, uh, uh, takes rest. I want to just ask her to respond to one particular issue as well, which is the question that was raised by quite a number of honorable members around what informed the guidelines. And I think this could be of value to just make sure that the honorable members have a full sense of how we actually came to, uh, to the targets that we had. So can I just ask you, Romila, to just respond to that very briefly? Um, what informed the guidelines from the demographic point of view? Why do we have so many Indians as a target and so on? So maybe let's get into that quickly. Yeah, thank you. So we were we had been following the ministerial guidelines, which were set by uh, the Department of Science and um, Innovation uh, in consultation with the NRF. And um, the, the, the target for the 2013 guidelines for South African citizens and permanent residents was set at 87%. And that 87% that, um, um, was, was to, to a large extent determined by the fact that there was already an agreement to fund 5% of students from the SADC region. And it also took into account the fact that there was a, um, a higher proportion of students, international students being funded, and it allowed for a period in which um, the, the number of South African students to be funded could be increased. Um, the proportion, uh, the decision to increase that proportion of South African citizens and permanent residents or, or, uh, to 95% is something that our NRF board felt very strongly about that we should increase uh, the proportion of South African citizens and permanent residents that are benefiting from this. Now data that we have not presented here shows that while we are making excellent progress in achieving the NDP targets for graduating 5,000 PhDs per annum, and we have now exceed, reached a point where we have more black PhD graduates than white PhD graduates, a large proportion of the black PhD graduates are not South African. So by 
directing more of these limited funding that we have towards South African students, we want to increase the proportion of Black South African PhD graduates. With respect to the 90% uh, for Black, uh, that aligns with the, the demographic targets in the country, having 90% uh, of our population being Black. As I've indicated before, we retain the 55% women, although we know we have more like 50% women in our population. And um, because we want to, we, we lose women as we get to the higher postgraduate levels. And we know both in public and private sector, we lose women as we go to the more senior ranks. The disability my colleagues have commented on, and we, we agree that there's a lot of work still to be done when it comes to um, persons with disabilities. At the moment, we are limited by the small proportion of graduates with uh, disabilities and the small proportion applying to NRF. Um, we have noted the DHET framework um, that was developed relating to the management of persons with disabilities at the institutions. And we will work closely with DHET in terms of their requirements for the institutions to create uh, an enabling environment for students with disabilities. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Romila. Uh, Gansen? Uh, thank you, CEO. Uh, through you, Honorable Chair, uh, one of the areas that was raised was the Poppy Act. I think, firstly, it was quite a challenge to broker a partnership with the South African Revenue Services. And I'd just like to place on record our gratitude to the DG and his team in enabling the NRF and the DSI to interact with SARS. Uh, SARS is very much aware of the Poppy Act. We would not be getting all the information, but it's a conversation that's currently taking place. And I'd like to thank Becky Hadebe from the DSI and our colleagues at the NRF who are having these conversations. There would be information, but the information would largely be to, to what you have chair had indicated that if we have to track our graduates that have been funded, uh, do, do they land up in government? Do they land up in business and industry? Do they land up in academia? Do they land up in the private sector? I think we'll be able to do this and um, now having access to this information. Obviously, SARS will solicit the uh, permission of the individuals in order to make that information available, but it's still uh, a work in progress. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Gansen. Maybe the last comment, uh, Honorable Chair, that was not responded to directly, but the DG covered it, um, relates to a comment or a, a, the question from Honorable King around the split, uh, which uh, was linked to our earlier presentation, uh, which uh, mentioned our split of funding, it being 20% PG uh, from the department and about 72% coming in the form of a contract and another 5% coming from, from other areas. And the question was about the challenges. I think the challenge, of course, becomes that uh, one only has a, a, a limited pool to then sort of work on certain things. And what's important to bring uh, honorable members here is the fact that as part of our mandate, the Bazaar element is just one, but we also have the element where we have to, to maintain the national facilities. And this is a very large uh, portion of these contracts uh, come to assist in terms of, you know, with SKA, for instance, and that will come with its own obligations that we need to uh, to adhere to. So in, in the main Honorable King, I think that's that's the, the challenge that we have. Of course, we have limitation, but the main aspect becomes, again, we just need more money. Once we have enough money, some of the problems that have been raised here can, can disappear. So with that, Honorable Chair, I would like to then hand over back to you, uh, believing that we have answered or responded to some of these questions. We are willing to actually provide written uh, responses to some of these questions that we might not have given uh, enough depth. Um, safe to say that for a number of issues that we raised, we are now collecting this data. We might not have it readily available. There's some data that 
uh, will inform our policy position going into the future because we believe that we have to be evidence-led and that's what we are, we are doing. So let me thank you for this round of questions and uh, yeah, uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you very much um, to the team from, from the DSI and from the NRF. <clears throat> um, and perhaps let's uh, hand over to the president of SALS to make his closing remarks as well and to respond. Can I just double check um, uh, Mr. Nelamondo? I hope I'm saying that correctly. If, if with regards to the disability targets, um, if I heard correctly when I heard that we dropped it because, so it was 5%, now it's 1% because we weren't getting the 5%. Was there no way for us to perhaps consider, uh, I don't know, increase, is it because there was no demand? You know, so it's one thing for a demand to be there, but for, for people not to take up opportunity. So, you know, they want to do their postgraduate studies, but maybe they aren't aware that um, NRF is given this particular funding, et cetera, et cetera. It's another thing um, for us to have over budgeted, you know, so we are certain that with this 1%, we're covering everyone that would wish to, um, you know, uh, fulfill their postgraduate studies. So I think that's just the one, one question, clarity I needed. Um, and then we do note that some of the questions you would like to respond to in writing, and we, we welcome that. Um, also because it allows you to, to, to really uh, be a bit more extensive and give greater clarity on those particular matters. Um, so yeah, so maybe if you can just uh, respond to this, the one on the targets for me, please. And then um, we'll move over to the president of SALS. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, maybe just to give a little bit of depth into that, I will ask Dr. Uh, Maharaj to just talk to this because we had a conversation on the very same matter. So maybe, uh, uh, Romila, if we may just shed more light into this, the disability aspect and why we moved it to 1% now. Thank you. Um, we also looked at historically the number of applications that we have received and um, we, I don't have the numbers on hand now, but we can provide that. There is a very small proportion of um, students uh, with disabilities that are graduating. And I think what is needed is a concerted effort between the universities and the NRF to identify these students um, much earlier on to be able to steer them uh, towards applications. We do provide in addition to the bursary, we also provide some additional funding for assistive devices um, for, for them. But um, it's, a, it's a question of, it's a very small pool and it does require a very concerted effort to identify and encourage students to apply. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that response. DG, I see your cameras open. Did you want to come in? Yes, Chair. I, I think we take the suggestion from the committee that says, yes, uh, the target was 4%. The response has been less than that. And I thought the question that was asked um, uh, by both um, the Honorable Mark Casey, if I'm not mistaken, as well as the, the whip, was what are we doing to make sure that we are able to go out there and find these people with disabilities? Uh, I think Honorable Mananiso. So I think it's something that I think we need to take to say, have we got a plan and a strategy to go out there and find this demand um, in order to meet this target? Because as we have explained in terms of what informed the policy, these are national targets. These are not targets that the NRF and ourselves came up with. It's the demographic profile of the country. And we want to make sure that at least the funding that is available uh, is meeting those demographic uh, uh, breakdown. Um, and of course, if we cannot meet that, again, the same question, 
What do you do to go and reach out to young women researchers who aspire? How do you encourage them? So I think that's something that we, we, we take back and something that we're going to go back and work hard at. It's the same thing with um, the Black students in the early discussions, you would find that when you speak to institutions and when you speak to researchers, they say, we can't find Black people. And then if you say, we will not give you the money, uh, all of a sudden there was a, 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 um, uh, the availability of students. So I think what you are asking us as a committee to say, when there are these demographics and these numbers that the country has set uh, itself, we have a responsibility to go out there and make sure that those numbers uh, are, are, are achieved and we have a plan. So maybe that's something we will take back in our planning uh, cycle so that next time we engage with you, we come up with a strategy on how we're going to uh, continuously looking forward and make sure that the demand for those targets is there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, DG. I think um, that's, that's very clear. Um, I think we can now hand over to the president of SAUS. Thanks again, Chair. Uh, I think, Chair, generally in the, in, the, in the community, we agree that there is a crisis in terms of uh, postgraduate funding. But listening uh, to the DG when, when he's saying that uh, the Minister of Finance has, has, has said that there will be no new allocations, we'll have to work with what they have in the sector. It, it, it brings a lot of work because it means that then there will be no increased funding, but instead we, we must play around. And ultimately, this is where you find uh, creative ways coming where you see introduction of age and, and, and other things. As a strategy, in fact, that's how you see it, as an element of reducing uh, the number of students that must be funded, which I think to us it is, it is a bit worrying. Also, there's a, I, I'm concerned, Chair, with the presentation that says yeah, the target for disability students have been reduced because I think in the main, we should be investing in the success rate of those students because you find that there are a high number of students enrolling into the institution, but there are very few who are then taking the postgraduate route. It means then we need to make more encouragement, invest more, in the success rate of those students in their academic studies so that we can meet uh, the target of 5%, you know, because we can uh, reduce uh, instead of increasing uh, the target. Also, I think that uh, we need to work around uh, part of the policy shift from, from NRF to say that, how do we deal with our capping uh, in terms of making sure that we expand uh, the number of students that we are funding uh, in, in the postgraduate and also start considering certain qualifications that we, we can consider in terms of funding. For an example, there are qualifications that you can't practice without you doing a, a postgraduate uh, a, a qualification of that particular qualification. So NRF must begin to in, start investing in those qualifications so that we close uh, that, that uh, gap uh, of students that want to, to access. Also, Chair, I think we, we need to have a, a, either a workshop or, or, or an endeavor program where we look at possible ways of uh, sourcing out funding and uh, possible ways of running campaigns where we can uh, go through in terms of, uh, of, of fundraising for, for the postgraduate students, because it is actually a problem, uh, the issue of uh, postgraduate students. Uh, if we are to reach the target set up by the NTP, we have to change our strategy in terms of uh, dealing with our postgraduate uh, funding. And uh, I think there must be a discussion ahead with some sitters. Uh, chair. I think there are some sitters that are used uh, to assist in terms of, uh, in terms of funding uh, some students who are unemployed uh, in terms of internship. I think must have engagement as well with those to see if they can assist us. I know that last year, there is a CETA that gave uh, SAUS 5 million to, to fund the students of construction. So if maybe we can engage such as to say that, can you please inject more funding to assist specifically with, with the postgraduate funding? Maybe we can be able to do uh, some small shift ar around there. Uh, otherwise, I think with the, with, the, with, the, with the meeting today, I think we all agree that there is a, a crisis of funding and the SAUs who are very much committed in working with all stakeholders uh, and making sure that we make a change in terms of funding their uh, postgraduate students. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Thank you very much, um, President. Um, we always appreciate really the contributions that SALS makes, particularly because uh, they do not only lift the challenges in the sector, but also um, give recommendations on how we can resolve a number of, of the issues that the sector is faced with. So again, we really must reiterate um, our appreciation for the presence and inputs of SALS this morning. Um, honorable members, um, I, I'd like to believe we, we can uh, close um, the meeting. And um, I think for us, what really stands out is the fact that um, the demand for postgraduate funding uh, continues and increases as, um, the, as, as, as the outcomes um, from, the under, from undergraduate studies um, are, are more favorable. And thus we need to expand um, uh, access to postgraduate studies and thus expanding funding for postgraduate studies and this is definitely a difficulty we have in terms of budget and so um, you know uh, what the DG is sharing with regards to the you know previous discussions with with Treasury um, it seems as though we have a lot of work to do in terms of advocating for an increased budget for postgraduate funding uh, as a portfolio committee, and um, this is where we really need the intervention, the political intervention of, of our colleagues from the ministry, um, and so um, we we have to we have to um, work together as a portfolio committee with our colleagues um, in the ministry in really trying to 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 increase in really trying to uh, engage treasury in increasing the budget for postgraduate funding. Um, uh, we would really like to get um, some of the documents that I think I'm just trying to find the name, Miss uh, Matutu, Matutu, uh, Miss Petiwe Matutu spoke to with regards to some of the nuances of the conversations that were coming out from the remarks that members made, and she was saying that there's, you know. Uh, a, a number of uh, research initiatives that are taking place with going into the intricacies of that, for example, in relation to analyzing the output in regards to um, research performance. So once, you know, X collective of students uh, are funded, um, what then then happens after that in terms of where their research goes um, and generally the, 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 the output of their research. And so it would be really great for us as the committee to receive those, those, those inner detail, or inner, I guess, uh, findings from the research that you're doing. Um, with regards to the written responses, um, the last time, <laughs> the, last time uh, the committee uh, presented, I said uh, on Friday, and um, our colleagues from the, um, from the committee, the, the, from the committee, the committee staff said I was being too harsh on the department, and we, uh, the department should be given at least, um, well, I think maximum at most, not at least, at most uh, seven days. So, um, uh, you know, but of course, if these can be given to us before that, uh, the written responses would truly appreciate for them to come before the end of the week. Um, uh, DG, you, you, you did indicate that, uh, I mean, there's, there has been some clarity with regards to the equity targets and the guidelines that have informed that. And I think if that can also come in writing, that would be appreciated. I think clarity has been given with regards to disability, but I, I really want to stress what the DG was saying. And I saw your remarks, um, Ms. Maharaj, in the group, but let's really try to find a way to perhaps not only, it's not a funding matter only, but ensuring that young women young people, black young women, um, black young women living with disabilities um, know that from their undergraduate studies, there is an opportunity for them to take up um, postgraduate opportunities so that, you know, we get to a point where the demand increases, where we say it's not enough for, for, for students living um, with disabilities. Um, and, and I think we must welcome the interventions in response to um, ensuring that a large proportion of, 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 of our graduates, um, particularly at PhD level, are Black South Africans. And so supporting them to, to achieve those goals is very essential. And so we welcome the interventions of the NRF and the department in achieving that. Um, 
And uh, I think um, DG, you had also mentioned that in with regards to funding, I think what remains important and is something that we need to continue working on is uh, um, you know understanding or having an overview of the demand with regards to uh, postgraduate studies um, versus what we currently cover. And I think um, once you compile that sort of analysis, uh, DG, it would be important for us to get that. And of course, the research on how we could centralize funding in the postgraduate sector um, to ensure that more students are covered and there's some sort of sustainability with regards to postgraduate funding. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. And of course, we want to continue to advocate for uh, the transformation framework that has been set forth by the NRA from the department and uh, continue to do this robust work that we're doing to ensure equity within science and innovation. It's not a transformed sector yet. Um, there's still a huge sentiment in the country that science and innovation is elitist and exclusionary. Um, and it's very important for us to continue being deliberate and intentional on how we see that particular change. I think last week, Honorable Mananiso, you may assist, I mentioned how we can't rely on the goodwill of people, and I, and I made reference in particular to issues around patriarchy, um, and that's the representation of women in various spaces. We can't rely on the goodwill of, of, of people to, to include us, of men to release their privilege and let go of their privilege and, and, and include us on the table simply because they're aware that, um, you know, uh, gender representation is important. Just because they're aware that it's important doesn't mean that, um, they will ensure that you know um, gender representation unfolds in the makeup of, of of leadership structures and on various institutions. So you know, targeting and setting goals um, on on representation is very important. And I think um, the transformation framework of the department is very intentional about that. And I think there is a few spaces where we need to um, uh, uh, um, reinforce. Um, the work we're doing and I think what has largely come out of the conversations this afternoon is that we really need to do a lot of work with regards to the representation of people living with disabilities. So I think having said that honorable members we can call the meeting to an end. Um, Anele or Shanaz I think we, we could have used um, this moment to um, go through some minutes but I don't think we, 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 we planned well enough uh, because I think there are minutes that are that are outstanding but hopefully if i think tomorrow we're just receiving two presentations from the department of science and innovation and the department of higher education and training on their programs in uh supporting the economic reconstruction and recovery uh plans of of of, of government so um yeah so i think if we have time tomorrow perhaps we should schedule for us to uh, go through some of the minutes that are outstanding and have those uh, adopted. So if, if nothing else, um, if you haven't left anything else out, honorable members, I think we can call this meeting to an end. Thank you so much. Long live the chair. Malibongwe. Long live the chair. Recording stopped. <laughs>